Namaste. My name is Amish Tripathi. I am uh, the director of uh, the Nehru Center. Uh, many of you have uh, seen this entire series of, uh, uh, of webinars that we have conducted uh, at the Nehru Center and onla online programs on uh, the 1971 War of Liberation of uh, Bangladesh, uh, which is also known by, uh, by many as the Indo-Pakistan War. Uh, this war... Uh, uh, was uh, a humanitarian war which led to the creation of, of a new nation, uh, to the freedom of uh, the oppressed people of East Pakistan who were being oppressed by West Pakistan and emerged uh, as a free nation in uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, we have covered uh, you know the naval operations uh, of uh, the Navy uh, through this war, uh, and this will be the last webinar of uh, this five-part series. And if I may introduce my partner in crime throughout this entire uh, series, uh, Commodore Shrikant Kesnoor, if you could be brought up on stage, please. Namaste, Shrikant. How are you? Uh, namaste. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon to people in Europe and UK. Wonderful to connect with you again, Amish. As always, uh, thank you for the support that Nehru Center has extended. And, and great, great to be with all of you today and to discuss uh, another episode of uh, 1971 war, the naval aspects. But uh, Shrikant, before we begin, I know I've introduced you four times already, but let me do it uh, one last fifth time. Uh, for those uh, who may be new viewers, uh, who may be watching this uh, series for the first time, and if you are, I would encourage you uh, to uh, watch the four prior episodes as well. They're all available on the Nehru Center uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook channel. So Commodore Shrikant Kesnur. Commodore Shrikant Kesnur, an alumnus of the prestigious National Defense Academy, was commissioned in the Indian Navy in July 1986. In his 36-year uh, career, he has had extensive experience in maritime operations, training, leadership, diplomacy, and communication. He has been the captain of two frontline ships, and in addition, his tours of duty have witnessed several important announcements, prestigious courses, uh, important assignments, prestigious courses, and interesting tenures at sea, uh, ashore, and abroad. He was also the Defence Advisor the High Commission of India in Nairobi, Kenya uh, and uh, with uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Seychelles, Eritrea and Somalia as his area of responsibility. He has a PhD from Mumbai University apart from five postgraduate courses in Science and Social Sciences. He is an academic besides being a Naval uh, Officer. Uh, he has uh, been a senior, senior faculty at Navy Military Colleges. He has also been the lead writer and chief editor of 11 books and many journals for the Indian Navy. I'm hoping to cross uh, Shrikant's uh, number of books uh, written in, uh, you know, in, in a few years. In addition, he's been involved with several academic, creative and corporate outreach endeavors at, of the Navy. He's presently the Director of Maritime Warfare Center Mumbai and is also Officer in Charge of the Naval History Proje uh, Project. He's been conferred the Vishesh to Seva Medal in the Republic Day Awards last year. Welcome back to the Nehru Center. Uh, thank you ever so much. Wonderful being with you all, like I said. Thanks for those very kind words about me. Uh, and you know what? Today, as you said, we discussed various aspects of 1971 war naval aspects. Today, we try to sort of put it all together. We call this topic or this theme as the X aspects. And we cover three issues in this. Technology, which was, you know, undergirding the whole war. Uh, jointness. How did the three services, uh, political, uh, diplomatic framework, all of them act together? And then, of course, leadership, because war is all about leadership at the end of it all. And to discuss that, you know, Amish, we've got uh, two very wonderful people with us today. Uh, we've got Admiral I.C. Rao, uh, a very, very uh, venerable veteran, as I would call him, uh, who's been there, done that. He's taken part in the war uh, uh, from, he was an important member of the Naval Doctor, but I'll talk more about that later. And then we have a very well-known, very published author called Sri Kumar Nair, 
and she has written a book recently uh, about all these aspects that we are talking about called uh, December in Dhaka. So, so the two, I think, give very, very beautiful, fantastic perspectives. One who has studied it academically from a scholarship point of view, one who was there, uh, who has followed it, and is history conscious in his own way. So let's get both of them front stage, and then uh, we can do the introductions. Perfect. Uh, welcome, sirs. Good to see you. Good to connect with you. Uh, wonderful to have you with us today for this panel. Welcome, welcome, Vice Admiral, sir. Welcome, Sri. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Amish. Likewise, it's a great privilege for me to be included among all these veterans and, uh, and diplomats. But if you may have the formal introduction. Sri Kant, you first. Yes, I'll uh, go ahead. And as I told you last time, you can't afford to go wrong with the admirals. So I, 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 I'd read from the very illustrious pilot that I've got, but I'll explain parts of it. Uh, Admiral Rao, I see Rao is from the 7th Coast National Defense Academy, Dehradun. That's one of the pioneer courses before it moved to Khadek Vasna. Uh, he went, uh, underwent engineering training with the British Navy at Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. HMIS Triumph, HMS Thesis, and the Royal Naval Engineering College, Plymouth. He earned his watchkeeping ticket in 1958 in the old INS Delhi, which was the Indian Navy's first capital ship, which had six boilers, two engine rooms, a gear room, driving four shafts, shafts of 72,000 horsepower. That's, that's a lot of power, you know, uh, for, for a ship there. He served in uh, the naval ships, iron ships, Gumti and Trishul, and was the engineer officer of iron ships Kaveri Trishul, which participated in the Expo 78 Osaka, Japan in 1970, and the aircraft carrier Vikram. He specialized in marine engineering design and underwent what is called the Dagger course at the Royal Naval College, Greenwich. This was followed by two tenures at Naval Headquarters, where he was a nodal officer for resolving design issues for indigenization of machinery for the Leander project. This was the period when decisions were taken to manufacture uh, Y160 boilers in the naval dockyard, main turbines at Bell Bhopal, turbo auxiliaries at HAL Bangalore, AC machinery and various pumps and a host of valves and fittings through Indian industry. Admiral I.C. Rao will be remembered for introduction of single helical mag gear design for main propulsion manufactured at a sugar factory at Valchandagar as a substitute for the British design gearbox, which could not be manufactured in India. Admiral I.C. Ram was an instructor at the Advanced Marine Engineering Design Course at Pune and was the commanding officer of INS Shivaji, a prestigious engineering establishment at Lulangla. He then served in naval dockyards as general manager at Vaisag and as the admiral superintendent, that's the head of the dockyard, at Mumbai. He was appointed Chief of Material in 1990, the senior most position in the technical branch of the Indian Navy. He retired in 1993, but served as the Captain Commandant of the Engineering Branch for a further year. Then Commodore I.C. Rao was awarded the Ati Seva Medal in 1984 for the indigenous development of crucial welding electrodes for repairs to the pressure hull of Foxtrot class submarines to resolve a crisis due to non-supply from Soviet Union. During the 1971 war, then Commander I.C. Rao was temporarily in naval dockyard Mumbai, overseeing the maintenance and repairs of iron ships Trishul and Talwar. As we are aware, Trishul and Talwar was the escort force for uh, uh, Minash in Operation Python. So the success of Operation Python owes a lot uh, to Admiral I.C. Rao. After his retirement, he was with an engineering company, BHP Engineers Limited, with interest in coastal shipping for bulk transportation of cement through self-unloading ships. He was recalled in 2019 to assume a new role as the Distinguished Chair for Marine Engineering at the Center of Excellence of INS Shivaj. He is a member of the Maritime Mumbai Museum Society, which is vying to establish a maritime museum in Mumbai. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished CV. Of course, he was also honored with the Param Vishis Seva Medal for a most distinguished service of highest order much later. Uh, but two or three things stand out. His contribution to the war, the theme of this talk, 
most importantly, his role in indigenization, uh, you know, as Indian Navy has progressively indigenized his played a big part. And thirdly, as a person conscious uh, about history, I think being amongst the pioneers, he has seen the Navy grow. And uh, he would, I'm sure, be a great storyteller about all that. I don't know if we will be able to get all of that today, but we so much look forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you and welcome again. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction. You know, Shrikant, if I may, if I may add to the three things that you added, there are uh, there are some men who you uh, whose reputation precedes them, and then you see a CV like this and you think, my God, what a man! And he's viewers, you'd be shocked to believe that uh, Vice Admiral Sir is in his mid eighties. Look at him; that should be the uh, the archetype that we should try and, um, and follow to be as fit as he is. Uh, it comes to me to introduce uh, the other guest, uh, Shri K. S. Nair, but uh, we are going to call him Shri through most of uh, of this uh, seminar. K. S. Nair is the son and son-in-law of Indian Air Force officers, both of whom served uh, with the Maritime Task uh, Six Squadron uh, IF. Once a schoolboy enthusiast, he now exercises a more serious interest in India's aviation, maritime, and military history, and has been writing on these topics for over 20 years. He has published nearly 100 articles, including some in American, British, and Japanese publication. Uh, he has written and published three books, Ganesha's Fly, uh, Fly Boys, The Forgotten Few, and December in uh, Dhaka. Uh, the first published by Anvation, uh, the uh, latter two published by HarperCollins India. Uh, outside of his interest in IF history, he's a graduate of IIT Delhi and IIM Bangalore. IIM Bangalore is a pretty good IIM, but IIM Calcutta is better. Uh, <laughs> and has and uh, KS Nair has served at levels up to vice president, CEO, and director at several multinational and boutique firms in the areas of consulting, investment, and development. Pleasure having you here, Sri. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a great you pleasure know, I, for me, uh, Amish. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, IIT, I am CEO. That's that's very impressive CV, you know. But uh, I'll be very, very glad to take on uh, both your father and father-in-law's maritime air squadron connection and hitch you to the Navy, you know. <laughs> I have to say, the Navy has always treated me very generously, even if I am an Air Force son rather than a Navy son. The Navy has always been very generous to me, and I am most grateful to them for that. So Thank it shows you. the Navy's large-heartedness. It does, it does, Shri. I couldn't, agree, I couldn't agree with you more. I have engaged so much with the Navy <coughs> officers through these five webinars. And without exception, I found them to be uh, uh, warm, pleasant, uh, you know, uh, well-mannered, the way they turned out, the way they carry themselves. And of course, I realized that that uh, behavior is reserved for friends. They're very tough on enemies. Uh, but fortunately, <laughs> uh, we are friends. Um, carrying on uh, on the seminar, uh, Shrikant, at the beginning, if I may uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, you know, the, the head of the India family in, in the UK, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner uh, of uh, India to the UK, uh, Gayatri Ayai Kumarji, a senior IFS officer, uh, and uh, she, this is her uh, message uh, during this, uh, this very, very important uh, webinar series. Namaskar. As India commemorates the golden jubilee year of the victory of the Mukti Bahini and Indian Armed Forces in the 1971 war. That was a landmark event as it resulted in the liberation of East Pakistan and creation of the nation of Bangladesh, our cherished neighbor. The war of liberation of Bangladesh and India's role in it was just a natural response of a close neighbor to grave violations of human rights. It was reflective of the values of the Republic of India and our commitment to safeguarding the similar rights of our brothers and sisters in our immediate neighborhood. It is a moment to pay tribute to the heroism and success of the naval forces the Indian Naval Forces who rose to the occasion and delivered in carrying out the mandated task in accordance with the highest standards of their training, capabilities and valor. 
When we as Indians look back at the 1971 conflict, we take pride in some other important aspects over and above the comprehensive and decisive armed forces victory. Key elements that come to mind in this context are, firstly, the liberation of East Pakistan heralded the victory of democratic forces, the birth of a new nation, Bangladesh, which is today a thriving and flourishing democracy is the most significant outcome of those operations in 1971. Secondly, given our common history, cultural linkages, and close people-to-people -people contacts and relationships, it was but natural that India should respond as it did to protect human rights, uphold justice, and respect for the electoral process. Thirdly, the victory of the 1971 conflict was also the triumph of values such as respect for language, cultural identity, a belief in peaceful coexistence, all deeply cherished in India and enshrined in the Indian constitution of the Bengali population and reinstitution of the primacy of the Bengali language and cultural identity to its rightful place in Bangladesh. These were, in our estimation, a major achievement of this operation. It was simply India's honest and no strings attached support for our friend and neighbor to achieve its legitimate aspiration. These were the non-military achievements of the 1971 operations. At the same time, it was the jointness of the Indian Armed Forces coupled with the bravery of the Mukti Bahini and the courage of the Bangladeshi people. It is this spirit that triumphed, which we have the honor to celebrate today. I would like to convey my thanks to all the eminent panelists and participants in this webinar. And I thank them for joining these commemorations and giving us their first-person accounts. With these words, I once again welcome you all and thank you for your interest. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, Gayatri Ayi Kumarji. Uh, uh, your words uh, you know, encourage all of us uh, in the work that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shrikant, over to you. Yes. And you know, Amish, just to sort of add to the glitter and prestige of the event, uh, we also have the Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Hari Kumar, who has sent a message for this uh, last of our webcast series. And uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce Admiral Hari Kumar, the Chief of Naval Staff. Admiral Har Hari Kumar is an alumnus of Juliet Scotton, 61st Coast National Defense Academy. He was commissioned into the Indian Navy on 1st January 1983 and is a specialist in gunnery. Now, Admiral Hari Kumar is amongst the very few officers, ladies and gentlemen, who's commanded a ship in every rank. As a young lieutenant, he commanded the Coast Guard ship C-01. Uh, he commanded as lieutenant commander the missile uh, boat INS Nishan, then the missile corvette INS Kora. As a captain, he commanded the missile frigate INS Ranveer, ultimately ending with INS Virat R aircraft carrier. He topped that a few years later, <coughs> commanding uh, the prestigious Western Fleet, which is called the Sword Arm of the Indian Navy. He's, of course, been very, very busy otherwise in various seagoing appointments. He's been the Fleet Gunnery Officer and Fleet Operations Officer of the Western Fleet. And he has served a whole variety of gunnery tenures on board our frontline fleet ships. Uh, his appointments ashore have also been involved in gunnery as the Command Gunnery Officer at Headquarters Western Naval Command. Uh, and as the training commander at INS Dronacharya. He has extensive foreign experience, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he has served in the Civil Military Operations Center of UN Mission in Somalia, uh, in Mogadishu from December 1992 to Jan 1993. Uh, he was also, uh, uh, he has attended the US Naval Staff Course at the Naval War College, Rhode Island in 1996. Uh, he has, uh, been uh, the advisor <coughs> to the government of sessions, naval advisor to the government of sessions, 
for a period of about two, two and a half years in the early part of the century. And he has a UK connection. He attended the Royal College of Defence Studies uh, uh, course uh, in UK in 2009. <coughs> so apart from this extensive uh, foreign experience or diplomatic experience, uh, he also holds numerous degrees. He is a BSc from JNU, an MA in International Studies from King's College London, an MPhil in Defence and Strategic Studies from Mumbai University, a PG Diploma in Shipping Management from Narottam Moraji Institute of Shipping, Mumbai. <coughs> the Admiral's flag appointments uh, include being the Commandant, the first Commandant of the Naval War College at Goa. Then thereafter, he was involved uh, at the apex of our training as a flag officer sea training before coming as fleet commander. Then in the rank of a three-star vice admiral, he was a chief of staff at Western Naval Command. He went on to head our personal services as the controller of personal services and then the chief of personnel in Naval Headquarters before moving uh, to the integrated defense headquarters as a CISC and the vice chief of defense staff. Uh, and after that, he took over as the flag officer commanding in chief Western Naval Command. So you can see a, a, a wide array of appointments in training, in personal management, in diplomatic, and above all operational roles. The admiral is a good swimmer, plays badminton, enjoys walking, very, very fitness conscious. And uh, it's a pleasure having him. He's extremely, extremely well read, and more importantly, he is always encouraging of scholarship and scholarly pursuits in the Indian Navy. Uh, let's hear what Admiral Hari Kumar has to say. Greetings to all viewers. India, having overcome threats that challenge our sovereignty, integrity, and prosperity, stands today at an important juncture in its story of growth and development. Ours has been a memorable journey thus far, and remembering the episodes that shaped it would help us navigate the contested present that we are living in and an uncertain future that may await us. In this connection, two significant campaigns driven by our government include celebrating the Swarnam Vijayavarsh or the Golden Jubilee of the magnificent victory in the 1971 war for liberation of Bangladesh and Azadika Amrit Mahotsav or the celebration of 75 years of India's independence. Both these commemorations tell us many stories of the actors, agencies, and participants who have contributed in propelling India forward. Consequently, the stories related to armed forces in this journey have found greater mention, traction, and appreciation amongst our people. Having said that, the Indian Navy, by the very nature of its job, operates in international waters often beyond the gaze and radar scan of our citizens. Naturally, its multifaceted activities tend to have been less visible, though these have significant impact on land and in our daily lives. It's for this reason the Navy is often called the silent service. Against this backdrop, I would like to commend the Nehru Center London for this initiative of bringing to light naval aspects of the 1971 war. This war marked the coming of age of the Indian Navy and will forever remain etched as a glorious moment in our nation's history. The Indian Navy's bold, decisive, and offensive actions inspire us even today to dare and deliver when the nation calls upon us. The five episode saga of naval action in 1971 war stitched together by Nehru Center will help us in keeping this legacy alive for generations to come. I find the webcast format involving narration by special guests, war veterans, experts, and historians interwoven with photographs to recreate the past particularly praiseworthy. In fact, I would venture to say that all the five episodes taken together could constitute a rich repository for future students of the war. Before I conclude, I would like to thank Her Excellency Gayatri Kumar 
India's High Commissioner in London, Sri Amish Tripathi, Director, Nehru Centre London, and all those who made this possible. Happy viewing, Samnovaran. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, wonderful hearing from you. Uh, Amish, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so much looking forward to this discussion with you. Uh, but before that, we have Commodore Anil Jaggi, uh, the Naval Advisor in the High Commission of India at London. So uh, Commodore Jaggi has done this in previous episodes also very beautifully. And I'm looking forward to what he has to say. Over to you, Commodore Jaggi. Thank you, Amish Ji and Commodore Kesnoor. The 1971 Indo-Pak War can be described as the Indian Navy's finest hour. Having covered the various facets of the Indian Navy operations in both the Western and the Eastern theaters during our earlier episodes, the webinar today very aptly covers the X factors of the 1971 conflict, such as leadership, technology, jointness, and other aspects which were unquantifiable, but contributed significantly to the Indian Navy's glory and success during this war. Looking at the factor of leadership, it is beyond doubt that India was blessed by truly dynamic, determined, and audacious leaders in the 1971 conflict. The political leadership was instrumental in undertaking the quintessential diplomatic activity by canvassing with the United Nations and many countries for political and diplomatic assistance to address the grave humanitarian crisis in then East Pakistan. For the eventuality of diplomatic efforts not yielding the desired outcome, the Indian Armed Forces leadership concurrently commenced preparations and became operationally ready for a likely military intervention in East Pakistan by the end of 1971. This was indicative of the strong political will and a sense of purpose to the developing situation in the East Pakistan. On part of the Indian Armed Forces, the able, charismatic and confident leadership of the three chiefs, namely General Sam Maniksha, the Chief of the Army Staff, Admiral S.M. Nanda, the Chief of the Naval Staff, and Air Chief Marshal Pratap C. Lal, the Chief of Air Staff, provided necessary professional advice and inputs to the political leadership prior and during the conflict. Innovative and out-of-the-box solutions were provided by the Indian defense leaders at all levels, which resulted in substantial gains and grabbing the initiatives during some very critical junctures of the war in the land, maritime, and air domains. For the Indian Navy, the war brought out the quality of naval leadership at several levels. Admiral Nanda, the chief of the naval staff, with his determination, ensured that the Indian Navy would not be left behind as in the 1965 war. He therefore convinced the political apex with his bold and offensive plans, which subsequently resulted in significant contributions of the Navy towards ensuring India's glory and success in the 1971 war of liberation of Bangladesh. Prominent mentions in the naval leadership calculus also include Vice Admiral N. Krishnan, the Flag Officer Commanding-in-Chief, Eastern Naval Command of the Indian Navy, who contributed greatly with his knowledge, intellect, and operational acumen towards conceptualizing the naval plans during the war. Not to be forgotten are the brave commanding officers who executed various operations in spite of all odds, and the committed officers, sailors, dockyard personnel, and defense civilians who contributed in their own special way in supporting the war waging potential of the Indian Navy. Use of technology, ingenious out of the box thinking, and a spirit of taking the offensive to the enemy is yet another facet of the X factor of the Indian Navy's character in the 1971 conflict. The novel idea of towing the missile boats for launching the daring missile attacks on Karachi, innovative repairs and modifications to overcome the limitations imposed by the cracks and leaks of the aircraft carrier Vikrant's boilers, radio interceptions of Pakistan's communications by signal intelligence, 
the dummy traffic which lured PNS Ghazi to its doom, and training of Mukti Jodhas for transforming them into naval commandos are just a few examples of the innovative thinking and optimum utilization of the resources. Another challenge that the Navy had to grapple with in terms of technology was a mix of old and new platforms, as well as equipment, which were existing in its inventory during the 1971 conflict. As a consequence, the Indian Navy had to ensure that the old platforms and equipment were made not only seaworthy, but also combat worthy and in good trim to fight to deliver when the time came. The 1971 war was also the first instance where the jointmanship between the three armed forces came to four, not only among the three chiefs and the highest levels of armed forces, but also at a tactical level or through mechanisms set up by the operation commanders. A noteworthy example of jointness was the creation of Force Alpha Task Force, which was created with elements of the Indian Navy personnel, Mukti Bahini, and erstwhile Bengali East Pakistan Navy personnel who had defected. This task force operated directly under the orders of the Army's Eastern Command at Fort William instead of being under the Indian Navy's Eastern Naval Command. This was possibly the Indian Navy's first and only riverine operation, and it was carried out jointly in complete cohesion and cooperation with the Indian Army. Fledgling steps towards joint planning of armed forces with the paramilitary forces and the essential services were also taken, especially in respect of signal intelligence. These joint efforts not only allowed interception of the Pakistani communications between its Western and Eastern wings, but also provided the breakthrough in deciphering the Pakistani naval code, thereby enabling early information of Pakistani plans. This significantly helped the Indian Navy to analyze the information and decide on the next course of action with a smaller observe, orient, decide, act, or OODA loop in comparison with the adversary. Areas of jointness also included air transport operations, maritime reconnaissance, and air support and counter air operations. In another significant demonstration of the jointness between the land and maritime forces, the Indian Navy flew 23 Seahawk sorties from the aircraft carrier Vikrant in support of Indian Army's advance to Chittagong. The procurement and induction of some contemporary naval hardware in the years preceding the war such as the acquisition of eight missile boats of the OSA class, which were involved in the daring Karachi attacks, five Petya class anti-submarine vessels, four submarines of Kalwari class, and the seeking helicopters, which were colloquially called flying frigates, also played a pivotal role in deciding the outcome of the war. Another takeaway was the magnitude of effect that Girdi Coast or trade warfare had at the strategic level in the conflict with the decisive actions taken by the Indian Navy towards disruption of trade routes, blockading of the ports, enforcing contraband control, and sinking of merchant ships of the harbor mouths, which resulted in severe disruption of supply lines and choking off any support to East Pakistan from West or vice versa. Considering the resources and other constraints the conduct of the naval warfare by Indian Navy in the liberation war of Bangladesh at both planning and execution levels is praiseworthy. As with all such conflicts, there were many takeaways for the future and the lessons learned from the 1971 war continue to guide us even today as we navigate ahead towards building an even more credible and capable Blue Water Indian Navy. Let's hear more of this from our panelists moderators, and special guests who will discuss the important X factors of 1971 conflict. Jai Hind. Uh, you know, uh, Amish, everybody else, this would not have been possible without uh, Commodore Anil Jaggi, who's uh, basically this initiative started off with him and the Navy Day celebrations a year and a half ago. So I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Commodore Jaggi for initiating this program and for always, always setting the stage beautifully 
with his initial introductions. Thank you so much, Anil, uh, for, for, for your work. No doubt about it. Thank you so much, Anil. Thank you. So, Amish, uh, that sets the stage, I guess. Now it is uh, uh, for us uh, and for our two distinguished panelists to take this uh, forward. And uh, I think uh, you have the first question uh, for, for Sri, or should I go ahead? Uh, okay, let me actually, but but uh, perhaps Vice Admiral Sir should be the first one uh, answering Sri Amtro. Uh, you're okay with no, that? No, if, uh, no, he's got a, a new thing about the just war. <laughs> Which is a new topic. I think I think that takes precedence because that's really historical. That's 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 very nice, Admiral Sir. So, Sri, if I may jump uh, into this. Yeah, topic. yeah. You please jump, and then I'll take the next question. Because there was a the the book of yours, December and uh, and uh, I found a very interesting uh, concept of of a just war, and I really wanted to uh, hear your views on this because. For the last 50, 60 years, many uh, major powers have uh, conducted what are called these humanitarian wars, wars of intervention. At the end of it, usually whichever country has been intervened in, many hundreds of thousands of people are dead. Uh, the country is usually devastated. Uh, there's uh, very little left uh, in those lands. And there are many examples of this over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, whereas, uh, if this is a war of intervention, then it truly is a role model that every other uh, major power should follow because uh, the Indian Armed Forces uh, went in and were out within a few months. Within uh, three months, they didn't stay for years and years to try and run the country. Uh, you know, the uh, Bangladesh, which was uh, formerly East Pakistan, had been devastated by West Pakistan. Uh, West Pakistan conducted a genocide there. 1971 killed approximately some 3 million people, 10 million people were displaced. Uh, Bangladesh, when it gained independence, was uh, was terribly poor, all because of the horrible exploitation and war crimes of West Pakistan, frankly. It's surprising that all those people just got away. They were war crimes. They should be Nuremberg type trials for West Pakistan. Having said that, Bangladesh is now richer on a per capita basis than uh, Pakistan. So this is a humanitarian war that was successful. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, uh, Amish, in every point uh, you've made, uh, most, many of which uh, I've expanded on uh, in some ways in my book. Um, I think um, you know, to, go, to go back to the start, I think the, the concept of a just war uh, has been uh, studied since, uh, you know, for, for centuries. In, uh, um, as long ago as uh, you know, uh, 300 or 400 <coughs> years ago, um, uh, the, the mainly Christian civilizations of uh, uh, Western Europe, they considered the Crusades to be a just war. Um, there were other, and uh, although the Crusades were in most military terms not a success, they were celebrated in uh, um, Western history at that time. I think over the years, the study of, uh, uh, of warfare and the justice of warfare has become a little more sophisticated. And in the last, in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, there is, at least among philosophers and scholars of, uh, of warfare, there is a broadly accepted definition of uh, what constitutes a just war. And there are about four or five criteria about um, uh, needing to stop a genuine humanitarian tragedy, about using only proportionate force, about um, uh, focusing the force on the perpetrators of um, uh, whatever it is that is uh, sought to being uh, terminated and so on. And by every one of those counts, uh, the, Indian, uh, the Indian Armed Forces campaign in Bangladesh in 1971 scores uh, at the highest possible level and it, uh, the, in, the Indian war, uh, the Indian the, the Bangladesh Liberation War and India's contribution to the Bangladesh Liberation War remains uh, in the eyes of those who, of, of the small um, uh, sort of subset of scholars who have studied this topic, it remains one of the best examples of a just war conducted in accordance with those principles. And there are there is a little more detail in my book. There are a couple of other um, 20th century wars which uh, might qualify in, in some ways. Uh, but one of the things I have been particularly, uh, I used to be particularly mystified and puzzled by was the extent to which the Second World War was classified as a just war 
and celebrated uh, certainly by the countries that were its victors, which have contributed greatly to the, the, the structure of the memory uh, of that war. And why no other war after that has been granted similar, uh, a similar standing. And in my book, I have come up with a couple of explanations as to why the, uh, uh, the uh, India's intervention in the Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971 did not accomplish that standing. And I'm happy to talk about those two whenever we have a moment. No, certainly we must. Explore, so we must explore that uh, in greater detail. <coughs> India has had a tradition of of uh, war for dharma, and maybe that informed the way we uh, we approach this. And perhaps maybe because we weren't a global superpower, this wasn't uh, this wasn't studied as much. But I should tell you that Bangladesh within the UK. Uh, speaks a lot of uh, the crimes uh, that uh, West Pakistan did on Bangladesh uh, and uh, how uh, the war liberated uh, them. And, and uh, many Bangladeshis are deeply upset how the world has ignored uh, among the greatest genocides of the 20th century, what the Absolutely. West Pakistan uh, military did on uh, the hapless uh, uh, then East Pakistani people. Sorry, Shikhar. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, following uh, in a very fascinated way. Uh, but, you know, as, as uh, we say, the practitioners, uh, ultimately it comes down to nuts and bolts, <laughs> as Admiral Rao might, might, might much, uh, you know, appreciate that statement. Uh, Rao, sir, I'll come to you and I'll come to the specific parts of technology later. But you are a commander, then a mid-run officer in 71. Uh, so, so can we have your perspective? I mean, I don't know whether at that time as serving people, you really think in terms of just war and all those things, or you're more focused on your work and what's happening. So can you just uh, guide us through what were the preparations for the war uh, when all of this was happening and how did how were you uh, as an active member of the Navy experiencing that moment? Uh, I feel that uh, we... we <coughs> concentrate on the job at hand in the Navy. Uh, we leave it to Naval Headquarters to uh, decide on future policy. Because I remember that in the time of Admiral A.K. Chatterjee in 68-69, it was a debate between missiles versus guns. And they said, oh, you only have four missiles on board. We have, you know, 20,000 shells on board. But everyone said, what is the hit probability of a shell? And what is the hit probability? Of... So these debates were going on in uh, naval headquarters as far back as 68 and 69. So the introduction of uh, missiles was really the game changer in the 71 war. Considering at the beginning of 1971, there were no missiles, there were no missile boats, there was nothing connected with missiles in the entire Indian Navy. Then look at it, uh, what I mean, these uh, modern missiles which are uh, fire and forget. Whereas we had missiles uh, which were anti-aircraft missiles like the SeaCat, which were beam riders and they had required lots of control after they were launched. Those were obviously not real homing missiles. Now, when these missiles came, everything changed. But the missile boats, people don't realize that they were only 170 tons, the entire boat, compared to what we talk of uh, now destroyers, which are in thousands or 3,000, 2,000, you have up to 7,000 tons. Yes. Now, these boats were actually brought on board a freight carrier. And <coughs> no uh, crane in Bombay to unload it. So please imagine that the boats were taken to Calcutta. <laughs> and only crane which could lift a missile boat out of a freighter and put it in the water was in Calcutta. So My that God. was the start of the problem. Because these are all to do with nuts and bolts. It's not to do with strategy or policy. <laughs> policies to do with infrastructure. <laughs> now, when they were unloaded, they had to be prepared to do a voyage of 7,000 kilometers to Bombay. Mm. Now, these boats have, were designed for 
uh, the coastal defense and those were uh, had the range of a missile boat is 200 nautical miles that's it and here they were asked to do a 7000 so that is the first part now to get them ready for it they were taken to garden reach workshop which had never seen a missile boat and they were made ready there and the uh, you must look at the russian philosophy russian the russian has design institutes which are dedicated to their uh, work and they produce fantastic designs which only a really technical person if you go into it will realize how deeply they think even about the color of the paint they think exactly and so these missile boats were fantastic now we had heard of if a car engine you, you would say four cylinder six and a v8 a view it was supposed to be the you know really ultimate in internal combustion engine design here we had a diesel engine with 36 cylinders now can you anyone imagine how you fit an engine with 36 cylinders 36 pistons 36 connecting rods 36 uh, injectors in one engine and there were three such engines on board so you can see it's a mind-boggling uh, design uh, feature and these missiles themselves were fantastic when you launch them they would go on a search mode when they found the target they would go to a tracking mode all on their own and your uh, missile uh, launching ship could reverse and get away safely. This was the design. Now, the uh, X factors which you talk about are that when they were had to be got ready in uh, the Hooghly, Hooghly is muddy. There's so much silt. Mm -hmm. And all that silt had to be dealt with uh, which no designer in the in the design institute of <laughs> Russia or Soviet Union would have would they, they don't allow such things. And, um, so uh, that was the start of the technical problems of the missile boat right from day one. And this, so, uh, I have got something which uh, people uh, don't talk about. INS Veer was one of the first ships to venture into launching. Yes. Do you know that one engine failed while she was 15 kilometers from Karachi? My God. I don't know how many people know that. My God. Because it My showed God. that the dirt and the uh, foreign bodies which had got into the seawater system had uh, edged themselves into the uh, blue boil system. And it showed that there were foreign particles. And the Russian uh, designers had put up alarms saying that if any foreign body comes into the uh, lube oil system, there's an alarm and it is considered as imminent danger because these are very, very high performance engines. And these are more like aircraft engines. You know, aircraft engines in yes. the Second World War had what I call radial cylinders. And you, when you have them at such high speed, by the way, these uh, boats were designed for a speed of 39 knots. And we achieved 42 knots during the Karachi uh, attack. So this is the amount of uh, technicalities which I can go on about. Uh, yes, yes. So, you know, uh, Amesh, uh, look at how beautifully the Admiral has sort of... Uh, uh, set it all up. I mean, there is at one level, you're talking of a grand strategic aspect of the war mm -hmm. and the other, as he says, the nuts and bolts and the Navy uh, dealing with these nuts and bolts. Uh, one is missiles, uh, induction of missiles and whole new generation. The second is a new engine, almost mm -hmm. like an aircraft engine, jet engine, preparation, all of that, propulsion. So there is something new on the propulsion front. There's something new on the uh, missile front. There's something new about, therefore, on the shore infrastructure front that needs to do all that. And then there is a human element of repairing the engine that is just stuck somewhere or getting 
the jugar and still being able to do 40 plus knots uh, on on a, a, a ship that was set and these were just about 200 tons i mean today you're talking of 5000 7000 ton uh, ships uh, but 200 ton ships with missiles i mean they were the game changers and they were in the front of technology at that time yes, but i think i think it set it up beautifully for us to yes. discuss the subsequent aspects no, fascinating there's i think about, sorry there's only sorry. about one small aspect of the war can yes you yes, <laughs> yes sir. this has to be multi complex it must be into, so this is only about one small boat in the, uh, and uh, all the other factor was time. Yeah. In January 1971, there was no missile board anywhere. Yeah. Hmm. And in December 71, there was a world beating, uh, uh, you know, uh, a fantastic uh, show yeah. of technology, hmm. uh, uh, bold strategy, and absolute immaculate execution of the attack. Fantastic. We'll, we'll Fantastic. deal with that, sir. We'll deal with that. You know, you can't give away all secrets in the first <laughs> question. <laughs> Fascinating. I think uh, he had his hand raised. So, see, you have something to uh, to add to what Vice Admiral yes. said. But if I can just add, uh, just ask one more quick question to you because uh, the Vice Admiral sir spoke of the nuts and bolts. If you could also just take us through uh, how India prepared for this war. Diplomatically, politically, etc. Besides this military, if you could take us through that as well. But first, your intervention that you want. Thank you, uh, Amish and uh, Admiral Sir. Thank you for those uh, uh, for those details. And um, I, I I just wanted to um, expand on it a little with, to also fit what the Admiral said into our themes of jointmanship and uh, um, uh, leadership and te uh, technology. Because uh, uh, what the Admiral described in respect of the missile boats, and as I'm sure he is very well aware, many of the weapon systems that we uh, introduced into the Indian Armed Forces during the period just before the, the 71 war uh, were going through similar sort of uh, um, adaptations to subcontinental conditions. And uh, in particular, uh, you know, I think uh, we can we can pick on the PT-76 tank, which the Indian Army had just introduced, which is an amphibious tank, again designed by the Russians, but completely unprepared for rivers of the size of the of the of the Ganga or the uh, or the you know the Padma in Bangladesh. I mean, European no European river comes close to to what to to uh, to our uh, subcontinental rivers, and not even the Rhine, which is such a cultural and ideological frontier in Europe. No European river comes close to in, in breadth or in current uh, to, to what uh, the Indian Army's tanks had to cross in Bangladesh. So we use the PT-76 tanks very differently from the way the Russian, uh, the Soviet designers had imagined. And the Admiral is absolutely correct. The Soviets, they put a lot of thought into every aspect of the design and the environment in which they have to operate. The PT-76s did brilliantly in a very different environment. The MiG-21, which has taken a lot of bad press um, in India uh, some years ago, uh, we use the MiG-21 in uh, the, uh, the Indian Armed Forces use the MiG-21 in a way very, very different from the way the Soviets had imagined. The Soviets had intended to use them as almost as cheap disposable instruments, which you flew intensively for 40 or 50 hours of combat flying and then abandoned. We've been using them as everyone here knows, we've been using them for decades. <laughs> and and uh, in the Navy, I mean, the, the Admiral is right about the new technology. I would also say that the, the you know, what the, the, the Navy's great leap, uh, conceptual leap, was to use those missile boats in an offensive way. Uh, the Admiral mentioned the 7,000 kilometer uh, uh, voyage from uh, Calcutta around the peninsula to Bombay and then <laughs> a few months later to Karachi. Uh, as he, uh, I'm sure, will be aware, the Indian Navy pioneered towing techniques during that voyage, which were used during the Karachi attack, and towing using nylon ropes rather than steel cables. These are all details of the, yeah. uh, you know, the imaginativeness and the jugaad that, that the Indian Navy yeah. brought in it. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 I'd like yeah. to intercede here about the MiG-21. How many uh, people know that the life of the engine of a MiG-21 is 15 hours? Would you buy anything if somebody were to tell you that, that the life, life of this engine is 15 hours? But 
the fact is it flies at Mach 2. In one minute, you are across the Himalayas. So, <laughs> where are you uh, when you talk of you talk of minutes, not hours? So, the life of a make of, of, of uh, 15 hours is a, a huge uh, <laughs> life. <laughs> so, when it uses an afterburner, look at the temperatures it uh, faces and so on. So, you have to look at the again, once again. The philosophy at the time, that's why you talk of design. You must look at the philosophy behind it. That is what training is about. Education sir, is sir. about that you look at the philosophy, the design philosophy, the operating philosophy, and get an understanding of all this when you are in command. That is you what know, is important. Not, yeah, uh, yeah. To say, you know, uh, the uh, uh, journalists sometimes pick at uh, bits and pieces. But you must sit back and say, what, what is it? What is the intention of this? What is the capability? And as I said, how many people know that the total life of a MIG engine is 15 hours? Would you buy anything <laughs> if somebody were to tell you that this is the life of But if you Don't start working at the philosophy, then it has a fantastic capability. Because in two minutes, that's what you want for the cap. You know, this, is kind of, this is the kind of thinking which I feel is not uh, appreciated adequately in uh, when you are in day-to-day -day work. Somebody yeah. should think, sit back and think of this. So it's a special you know, no. for armed forces. Yeah, uh, Shri, but but Amish, now it's very obvious that our our panelists have stuck this fantastic jugalbandi notes. You know, both of them Absolutely. are feed, feeding into each other. And they're hitting the high notes already. But but you know, it's it's a little unfair probably to our viewers who are still who still need to know some of the basics because one of your questions that you had asked to Sri was how did we begin the preparations at the military, political, and diplomatic level? So Sri, you could probably, you know, sort of uh, do a very quick answer on that. And then I'll again go on to ask Admiral Rao about the specifics of technology induction and all. I, I can see both of you we got very excited about technology induction. But let's let's build our let's get our viewers, let's get our viewers along it. At times I think Srikant, the both of us aren't required. <laughs> if you let the admiral and me, uh, to, if you leave the admiral and me to us, we'll start talking about uh, details of, uh, of the, <laughs> the combustion cycle before, <laughs> before the, before the uh, event is out. So, we yeah, but sorry, yeah. Sorry. political no. and diplomatic no. preparation for the war. Sure. To uh, try and do a very quick um, uh, response to that, I think um, on, on the diplomatic side, as um, well, uh, actually, if I can um, stick a pen and take, make a broader point, I think. One of the unique aspects of the of India's involvement in the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War is that, and I will say this, this may be controversial, but I will say this, it is the only one of India's post-independence wars that we were prepared for. We knew it was coming, we could see it coming, and uh, we and we had the good fortune that we had a we had a military and a, and a, um, a diplomatic and a civil service establishment that for all the differences between them, they worked together to prepare us for this war. So I would say that, you know, from March onward, from March 1971 onward, which is when the Pakistani, what they call the Pakistan, what they call the crackdown in Bangladesh, Operation Searchlight, uh, when, when they started um, uh, on their uh, perpetrating those, uh, some of those atrocities that we, you know, we can uh, talk about. From that point onwards, I think India knew that there was a crisis and we had to be prepared for it to be solved by war. Now, the uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister at the time and her cabinet were all um, uh, very keen to try out all possible diplomatic avenues to find a solution first, partly because they had the shrewdness to know that it would stand us in good stead to demonstrate that we had tried out all diplomatic avenues first. So they spent several months trying to raise the world's attention and bring the world's uh, uh, attention to the humanitarian crisis that was developing in Bangladesh to no avail. And we know now that a large contributor to that was that the United States was at that time engaged in a covert outreach to China, which was being intermediated by Pakistan. 
And for that reason, the United States did not want to embarrass Pakistan in any way. We know that now, but it wasn't known at the time. But we did put in several months of effort to try and raise the issue diplomatically to no avail. And <coughs> in August, I think, of 71, we finally signed the uh, Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation with the Soviet Union, which bought us the diplomatic protection, the cover in the security count, the UN Security Council that we needed in order to conduct the war. Without that diplomatic protection, without the Soviet Union's veto, we would have been stopped before we got to the gates of Dhaka. And there, I can talk about the specifically about the Polish resolution, uh, which was introduced in the, in the Security Council just two days before the Indian Army reached Dhaka. That's, a, uh, that's another story. But apart from the diplomatic uh, initiatives, there was a, a, whole, uh, a whole country movement. I think the, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy were all uh, engaged in uh, preparing for what they pretty much realized was, uh, was uh, very likely to be an inevitable war. And, and they didn't waste that time. All three services made excellent use of that time. As the Admiral had said, the uh, the, the, uh, the, the missile boat crews were undergoing training in uh, the Soviet Union at the start of the year, the start of 71, and they only came back around October or thereabouts. Uh, the seeking crews were undergoing training in, uh, the, the seeking anti-submarine helicopter crews were undergoing training in the UK uh, at about the same time, and they also came back to India only about the third quarter of uh, 1971, and there were problems with the torpedo launch mechanisms, which were resolved by, by a couple of very smart technical officers in Bombay, and um, the, the, so we were we were preparing for it. I mean, there are there, there are literally dozens of examples, dozens of examples of the technical preparation, and in my mind, equally importantly, the conceptual preparation. This was a war that we knew was coming. We were able to plan for it. We were able to plan an offensive component, which I don't think we succeeded in doing in most of our other wars. So I think the fact that we had the, the fact that we knew it was coming, the fact that smart diplomats and smart senior uh, military personnel knew it was coming was a huge contributor to our success in this war. Wow. wow. Uh, sir, uh, Rao, sir, uh, you know, Sri has zoomed it out beautifully. I'll zoom it back in. Uh, he talks of conceptual preparations, but he talks wonderfully of technical preparations too. Now, you yourself previously have talked of the various you know, uh, the, the finesse of Russian design, uh, the discussions in Navy between missiles and guns uh, from Admiral Chatterjee's time. So all of this talked of a Navy that was itself grappling with changes in technology and seeing how to come to terms with that. But obviously, it would not have been easy. For one, you have trained in the UK yourself. For one, all our training was in UK until then, English, so there was a method to the madness. You know, the SOPs were the same. Now you had to learn in a new language. The SOPs were different. There were lots of things that were different. So how did all this change, uh, reorientation from, from the Brits to the, to the Soviet Union, the new hardware, how did the technical branch of the Navy and other people, not just the technical branch, uh, sort of, uh, you know, come to terms, adapt to these changes very quickly so as to be prepared for the war. Uh, so just you can unpack a little bit on that for us. Yeah. Well, I would say that uh, the submarine arm did very well as far as uh, switching from uh, the Western way of thinking to the Soviet Union way of thinking. Because I feel that A, uh, there were people who had already had submarine training in the, U in the UK. Uh, before there was a political, uh, I would say, uh, decision to go to the Soviet Union. So the uh, submarine crews were well selected and they were put in an island <laughs> in off Vladivostok in the most inhospitable conditions. And they were, uh, they were allowed to take their families with them. So they were fair, well settled. And they first learned the Russian language. They, they entered a class where they were not allowed to speak any other language. They, that's how they learned. Uh, they were thoroughly familiar with Russia. And I think Indians, uh, especially the people who are educated in our school system, they are good at uh, languages. They, and many of them 
became experts in uh, Russian language. I know that uh, Admiral Shravat, for example, uh, speaks uh, perfectly and he can uh, watch uh, television on, he still does, I think, uh, at this age. He's my course mate. And uh, so many of them, uh, Admiral Audito, all of them became very good at Russian. So they could read the Russian books and they absorbed their proper uh, te techniques, technology, their may not be the uh, tactics and uh, strategy, etc. Those, those were not part of the training. But as far as the day-to-day uh, -day running of it was very well absorbed by the Russians, by the, uh, by the Indian crew. But this was not true of the uh, Petya class because they were there for shorter periods. They were not allowed to take their families. Uh, they were... Uh, First of all, their philosophy of operating, once again, I come to this, of the Pechas, they were also supposed to be uh, defense-oriented vessels. They, would, they were supposed to have large numbers in their ports. And they, I think uh, they were intended that they would go at high speed and attack an uh, incoming uh, carrier group or something like that. And uh, very large numbers. And they were again had very low uh, endurance because they was they had a, a particular uh, type of propulsion called uh, combined diesel or gas turbines, uh, diesel and gas turbines. These were because uh, for cruising they had only a one small diesel engine, but for when they when they meant business, they would switch on their gas turbines, which were thirty thousand horsepower, and shoot out. But that was only for very short periods. And this was for their climate conditions. When the gas turbines come to tropics, they suffer because of the intake temperature is high, which the aircraft people don't realize because they accept it during takeoff. The moment they are up, their uh, intake temperatures are below freezing. Whereas the gas turbines in India in, under tropical conditions have a, so the Petyas had a lot of uh, limitations in our way of thinking. So even the training was less. The uh, books, uh, which were translated from Russian language to Indian language, I think they were not done by technical people. They were done by arts graduates in some cases. So they could not. Arts uh, graduates. <laughs> because, <laughs> from, yeah, because they are, they were school of languages. Uh, the people thought that. <laughs> so, the uh, naval officers who learned the Russian language thoroughly, they could read the the. Uh, there was always a famous story when they said the voltage should be constant. It was translated from it would be DC voltage, which would be a disaster. <laughs> like that. Or. Uh, uh, so on. The, 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 there was a problem. But in the case of missile boats, we had recruited a batch of uh, officers, uh, one large batch in 1968, who turned out to be a brilliant batch. And they were the ones who were all sent to missile boats. The missile boats had the most brilliant officers uh, we had. And they were the ones who did all these things which I was talking about. Uh, getting over the problems. And can you imagine that this 175-ton boat, their workup uh, was done during the monsoons because they were only arrived in Bombay at the, at the beginning of in June. And between June and September was their workup, which was under very trying conditions for them. And they had to do all those drills during that time. So this showed their metal of these officers. And you know, Amish, I know you have a follow on on this. I can see you're very eager to ask. But, you know, just just to unpack what the Admiral has said, I think, you know, uh, uh, he has talked of different set of ships, the submarines, the Petya class, the missile boats, and all of them which we acquired from uh, the erstwhile Soviet Union at that time. Uh, each were, I would say, used by us. Uh, taking all the knowledge from the Russians, used by us for Indian conditions. 
making those kind of allowances, you know, meeting the challenges, obviously. But we use the petias like frigates almost, you know, they were meant more maybe again for close coast patrolling. We use them as frigates. We made, we made uh, much use of, of our limited resources. And like he brought out the missile boat crew, all of them, actually much of camaraderie is also built when you're thrown in on a remote island far off, I mean, at very most of. So I think these are stories within stories, you know, and, and uh, we have discussed this before. But I think there are at least about half a dozen books here for future authors like Sri to talk about these, what these experiences in distant parts of the world entailed for lots of people and perhaps how some of the roots of India's victory lay in distant parts of the world, you know. So, so that's 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 uh, uh, no. innovation. But I want to, uh, you know, sorry, it, sorry. Uh, she brought out that what the diplomatic levels, etc. But at the ship level, things are very different. Uh, nobody th talks of what uh, she was mentioning. In the ship level, when you leave harbor. As soon as you cross the 12 nautical limit, you are in international waters. Hmm. So at that point of time, you have to be as ready as you can be for a, a war. And this can be in peacetime. And uh, people don't realize that uh, as soon as a ship leaves uh, Bombay Harbor, within uh, one hour, you are in international waters. And I remember that when uh, I was in Trishul in 1970, when we went to Osaka, as you mentioned, on a passage from here to Japan, we saw more warships than merchant ships. When we were in the South China Sea, uh, American uh, aircraft would come and check on us, check on our passage every single day. So now those are war conditions almost. Yes, yes. Whereas, uh, in fact, some uh, one of our smart uh, navigators asked the aircraft, American aircraft once, uh, saying that, why have you switched your radar from tracking mode to, uh, you know, from search mode to tracking mode? Please go back to search mode. Can you imagine <laughs> a conversation like that? It's in, go in full peace time. Uh. So, therefore, there is no difference between peacetime and wartime in the Navy because you, that's how it should be. That's when right. you are, say you are ready and our seniors uh, and the tradition is continued that when you are ready, you have got the full war complement on board. Whether it's weapons or fuel or whatever it is, it's, it's not like... Uh, in, you know, your WEP, etc., these which other services uh, try and use. There's no, no as, as far as I could imagine, there's no such thing in the Navy. And, and I myself have sometimes talked to myself saying that if there was a war, is there anything more I could do now for what I'm doing? Very little. Because you are almost, at, as I said, that obviously if you have an American aircraft overhead, you are going to be alert. That's how it is. As you should be. Just a bit more on uh, the preparations, Admiral Sir. You know, the if you could take us through the preparations that were done in the naval dockyards uh, in Mumbai, in Vizag, uh, for this war. Because over the course of this seminar, I've learned various things. You know, the boiler problems in our aircraft carrier. Right. Uh, you know, among the things we learned from the Russians that, you know, at times, uh, forgive, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a civilian. So if I make a mistake, please forgive me. But, you know, that the warriors and the maintenance crew were different. Whereas in uh, Russia, it is, uh, you know, the sailors themselves should know how to maintain so that you can uh, you can repair things. Uh, if you can take us through some of the stuff that was done at the dockyard uh, as well. No, uh, I would say that our dockyards uh, are in the naval bases. They are not completely separate. Like in the Air Force, you have BRDs, the base depot depots, which are completely... Uh, insulated from day to day, but our dockyards are not. Uh, if a ready duty ship has to load a missile uh, on board, uh, it, it, there would be dockyard workers, dockyard staff doing it. Where there would be there would be a barge, there would be a power, there would be a crane, whatever it is. In uh, Vishakapatnam, 
there has been some separation between the operational uh, maintenance uh, areas and the deep repair areas. But in Bombay Dockyard, the way it has grown, uh, that's not really possible. Now, uh, the as I said, that even in peacetime, we are on war mode. Uh, so therefore, there's very little difference as far as the work, because the pressures, the uh, timelines, the kind of work that you do, and uh, because once it goes inside a ship, it has to work. You can't take it out uh, easily. So therefore, it is uh, preparation for war is routine, considered that way. The only difference is that in 71, certain uh, maintenance activities were postponed. That is, some ship would have started a refit in 71, was said, no, uh, this is not the time, so we will postpone that refit. Some, they, and they saw the, it was a wonderful sight to see in December uh, uh, or end of November uh, 71, where the dockyard berths were empty. We had never, never seen that. Uh, so the credit for that really goes to the uh, dockyard uh, admiral who was admiral B. R. Singh then, and there was an engineering uh, head of the engineering was Commodore Narendra Bhalla who came. They, they were uh, so delighted to walk around the dockyard with no work because all the <laughs> ships had gone out, <laughs> and it was strange for them because. You, they would not ever had uh, uh, any morning where they didn't come on into the into the dockyard full of problems in their head, saying, "What shall we do this? That to, how to tackle that problem?" And of course, there was a leadership by uh, one Admiral J T G Perry later J T G Perry. He was a commodore then, as Chief Staff Officer Technical, who was a tremendous personality, and he died at the age of 97. Uh, only two years ago. Okay. So uh, he had uh, the personality to uh, that leadership where everything got done and the dockyard was empty in uh, November, December 71, which was a very, very strange sight. <laughs> Some, those days, I don't think there were satellite pictures, but that would be a rare picture. <laughs> You know, uh, Amish, uh, the admiral, very, very typical of him, is being extremely modest about his own role in the getting Trishul and Talwar ready. But you know what? We've got uh, one other officer, a distinguished war veteran, uh, who was a part of the war, on board the aircraft carrier Vikrant. You're mentioning about the Vikrant and its boiler problems. We got someone to talk about those challenges as well in form of uh, Admiral Bharat Bhushan. Uh, Admiral Bharat Bhushan, a very distinguished officer. He was a senior engineer officer on board the Vikrant uh, and, and was directly in charge of several of the maintenance issues there. Over to you, Commodore Jaggi. Thank you for affording me the opportunity of bringing on screen Vice Admiral Bharat Bhushan. Let me introduce the Admiral to our audience. Vice Admiral Bharat Bhushan, Param Vishesh Seva Medal, Ati Vishesh Seva Medal, Nausena Medal, is a retired 1971 war veteran of the Indian Navy. He undertook his initial naval training at Britannia Royal Naval College, Dartmouth, and in various Royal Navy ships in the United Kingdom. He thereafter completed his basic engineering and marine engineering specialization courses at the Royal Naval Engineering College at Plymouth, UK, and he was commissioned into the Indian Navy on 1st May 1956. During his illustrious career, the Admiral has served in various Indian Navy ships, such as INS Delhi, Ganga, Trishul, aircraft carrier Vikrant, and submarine depot ship Amba. He also took part in the liberation of Goa operations in December 1961 and during the 1965 and 1971 wars. He has been an instructor at the Naval College of Engineering, INS Shivaji at Lonavla, and he also has the distinction of serving as an instructor at the Imperial Naval College, Masawa, Ethiopia, on deputation. His other noteworthy appointments during his career in the Navy have been Command Engineer Officer of Western Naval Command, General Manager Technical, and Admiral Superintendent of Naval Dockyard 
Vishakhapatnam. After his retirement in November 1993, he was employed as a civil servant in the Ministry of Defense under the Defense Research and Development Organization till August 2000. We are indeed honored to have him as a special guest for today's webinar. Let's hear Admiral Bhushan share his experiences of the 1971 war. I joined Vikram as senior engineer sometime in May 1970. Thereafter, about one year was spent in carrying out detailed investigations of the boiler drums. The ship had four boilers and the water drum of one of them, the A1 boiler, had developed leaks in way of riveted joints of dished ends. These are the ends. As a result of extensive radiography, it was determined that A1 boiler could not be used. But the other three boilers, though showing incipient cracks, could be used with some limitation. A1 was therefore completely blank and isolated. And as an additional measure, big harnesses made up of thick rods and brackets were manufactured by the dockyard and fitted on all water drums. We sailed for the East Coast sometime in May 1971 with only three boilers and a limitation of a total of 5,000 steaming hours. I may mention that in the event, we steamed about 10,000 to 15,000 steaming hours, but without any formal approval. Initially, we were based at Madras. We returned periodically after extensive workups in surrounding areas for fueling and self and assisted maintenance. At times, we did stop at certain places. However, as far as I recall, throughout this period, we never stayed at any one place for more than a day or two. From hindsight, this was perhaps the main reason for any hostile ships or submarines not having been able to locate the exact position of Vikram. For us, the war really started about three or four months earlier. We were based off Port Blair of Andaman Nicobar Island. And we had daily dawn and dusk action stations and extensive periods of flying and other exercises. As no fleet tanker was available, the Navy hit upon the brilliant idea of utilizing the landing craft ship INS Magar as a tanker. Her ballast tank used to be filled with oil and diesel fuel, etc. And then she would come and fuel us in remote locations. We, in turn, also used to provide diesel fuel and fresh water and engineering and workshop support to our escort mission. I may mention that apart from propulsion itself, the boilers were also required to provide steam for ship's steam catapult used to launch aircraft. This required a great deal of skill and expertise from the boiler and engine room watchers to meet the conflicting requirements of high-speed steaming and catapult operation. Here, I would like to pay a tribute to my watchkeepers for so gallantly rising to the occasion. One incident particularly shows the morale and dedication of our crew. When the Seahawk aircraft of 300 squadrons landed after their first attack sorties, the engine room sailors made a large garland of 10 rupee notes and asked me to put it around the neck of Lieutenant Commander. SK by G.G. Gupta, CEO of the squadron, on his arrival. For us, the actual period of war was a continuous blur of high-speed operation and at times, violent maneuvering to evade suspected suspects. 
There were occasional and sudden breakdowns which had to be tackled at top speeds since aircraft were either waiting to land or to take off on a mission. Occasionally, standing on the engine room platform at the bottom of the ship, one heard depth charges going off at a distance. It was quite a frightening experience, but in the heat of the moment, one disregarded it and just got on with the job. Leadership aspects. The standard of leadership from the highest level down to the ship itself was very high indeed. Decisions were made quickly and everything was done to keep up the morale of the ship's crews during these difficult days. As an example, our own commander used to address the ship's company on the ship's broadcast every evening and acquaint us with all the latest developments, good or bad. Technical aspects. Mercifully, technology at that time, over 50 years ago, was pretty basic. And most of the support we really needed was in the form of repair, of repair or renewal of copper and steel pipes and valves, electrical motors, and etc. Et this could be adequately provided by shore workshops. The standard of maintenance of aircraft I must say for the ships, by the ship and air engineering staff or air electrical staff was also quite high, as was evident from the fact that aircraft availability was quite good. Lessons learned. I'm afraid I'm not qualified to comment on carrier versus missile warfare question. Over the intervening 50 years, technology has advanced and new weapons and tactics are continuously being evolved. But remember, nations are still building bigger and better aircraft carriers and operating them in large number. So they must be still necessary, particularly as they provide for force protection at distant areas. Lastly, I would like to say that in any conflict, special attention needs to be paid for meeting the logistics requirement of ships and submarines, especially at remote positions. Thank you. Oh, wow. That, 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 that was interesting, isn't it? So, uh, 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 you know, now, now uh, 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 Shri, uh, we have discussed technology and I know someone like you and Admiral uh, would want to keep discussing technology uh, for as long as it takes. But we've got a couple of other issues too. So jointness is one of them. Uh, so one of the things that your book covers is how operations, you describe different operations of the three forces to sort of show how they acted sort of in tandem. Uh, so would you like to you know, tell our viewers how you said we were prepared for this war? How did this bear out on the ground in terms of uh, jointness and operations? I'm not distinguishing joint operations, but jointness and operations so that the ultimate uh, decisive outcome was facilitated. How did all that happen? I'm happy to offer a couple of uh, uh, sort of stories or anecdotes. I think, as you know, I think uh, um, one of our most distinguished uh, Navy chiefs, Admiral Arun Prakash, was at the time of the 1971 war, he was on an exchange program with the Indian Air Force. And as many in, um, uh, Navy combat pilots do, they undergo a tenure with an Indian Air Force unit. So they, they have more exposure to, uh, to a larger um, uh, uh, an air operation than might be possible with the Naval Air Arm uh, alone. And, Admiral, uh, and uh, then Lieutenant Arun Prakash was with a particularly uh, successful um, Air Force squadron, number 20 squadron. And uh, uh, every Air Force officer, uh, and I, I, I happen to know many of the members of that squadron quite well. The squadron CEO at the time was a good friend of my, uh, was a, was a um, junior commander's course, course mate of my father. And uh, uh, without exception, the, uh, the Air Force officers uh, 
treated uh, Lieutenant Arun Prakash as one of their own, except for the fact that he wore white shoes, which led to a little uh, contretemps <laughs> with the air chief on one occasion. Uh, but um, uh, he, he, he just uh, fitted in. He proved to be an, uh, an excellent pilot, an excellent leader. Uh, uh, he was uh, clear to lead formations of two and four um, aircraft and, uh, and discharged his duties with complete... Uh, uh, you know, in, in an admirable way, and uh, you know, received the Veer Chakra. Recommended uh, was recommended for the Veer Chakra by the Air Force, and not by the Navy. And the Air Force keeps arguing that that Veer Chakra should show up in the Air Force listing, not in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> At the other end of the scale, I think you know we, we've mentioned the Vikrant. I think the Air Force was actually happy to let the Vikrant and her small complement of Seahawks and Alizes look after uh, um, aerial operations roughly south of Chitt Chittagong and southwards. Right. So, so the, the, the Air Force was concentrating on air operations north of Chittagong and, uh, and, the, and the naval air arm was uh, sort of handed the responsibility of looking after air operations south of Chittagong. And uh, it, it worked. And I don't know that it was uh, uh, done on, on the basis of... Um, a uh, very deep staff uh, discussion as to which would be the most effective way to do it. But it was in the way of, uh, you know, the, the, the mid-level officers of that time, they were, they were very practical commanders and engineers and commanders, and uh, they took practical decisions. Is it right? We'll draw a line, uh, you know, east-west from Chittagong, and the Air Force say, can do all the operations north of that. The Navy can do the operations south of that. And um, as we know, uh, uh, later Admiral Gigi Gupta and uh, Commodore Deer. Uh, who were the the two uh, the, the CEOs of Squadron Commanders uh, on both the Vikram? They 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 took the opportunity with both hands and you know just ran with it. So you could not have asked for more. I think um, I, 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 as the uh, as Admiral Rao says, I doubt very much that either of them was invited into any deep uh, staff planning where the, these issues were discussed. Right? But when they sailed, when the Vikram sailed. They were, they were given the, their targets. Cox's Bazaar on day one, Chittagong on day two, and they, uh, you know, uh, the, the Seahawks by day, the Alice's by night, and they, they, they did it. It's, they just did it. it. It truly shows, I mean, even as an outsider, the power of jointness, the power of putting, uh, you know, the overall war effort above everything uh, everything else. See, if I can just, you know, so, sorry, Shikant, if I may just, you know, because I, I find this fascinating as, as a civilian. So, if you could take Actually, us... You know, joint manship, there's one more aspect. Yes, which sir. Is, uh, amphibious options, you know. That requires huge amount of uh, understanding of the limitations. And uh, if when uh, Ghadiyal or Guldar were going to beach, they want uh, yes. to know uh, what the height of the soldiers is. Are they going to yes. be Gurkhas or Rajputs? Yes. <laughs> which are going to be wading through the, uh, you know, the water. Yeah. And so there can be very serious uh, issues in uh, amphibious operations. True. There's where jointmanship and even uh, the PT-76 tanks sometimes are, you know, swimming. There you should see how the JCO is asking, looking at the uh, engine temperatures <laughs> and, uh, you know, asking us uh, uh, what, is, what is to be uh, so on. The jointmanship in amphibious operations is, you know, vital. It's a matter of life and death sometimes. No, it's Absolutely. fascinating. And if you can, you know, for, for the benefit of a civilian, if you could take us through one or two big operations where the Army, Air Force, Navy really worked together and delivered a decisive blow to, very briefly, you know, a, a decisive blow to the enemy, uh, to Pakistan's war effort, if uh, in layman's terms, if that would be fascinating. Sir, either of you, sir, Vice Admiral, sir, or Sri. No, no, I think Srikant is. <laughs> Uh, more qualified than, uh, on that. Not, 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 uh, Sri Kumar. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, uh, I, I was sometimes addressed as Sri Kant on occasion when I was in college, but that's a different uh, story. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, I'm sure the Admiral can speak to this. He brought it up, but uh, as he says, there was a there was a combined opera, combined armed operation uh, south of um, uh, Cox's Bazaar um, uh, towards the second half of the. Um, um, of, of that short war. And the logic for that was that uh, we were here, and indeed there is evidence that some uh, uh, Pakistani uh, personnel escaped into Burma through that 
uh, southeastern corner of Bangladesh. So there was a necessity to, to block that corridor. And to block that corridor, we deployed, the India deployed um, uh, you know, its landing ships uh, and landing craft um, with, um, uh, you know, uh, with a few hundred um, army troops on board. And in fact, as, uh, as the Admiral says, uh, as it happened, the first uh, uh, landing craft that, uh, uh, the, way the, the way these operations work is that landing craft are, very, uh, um, are uh, ships with very shallow bottoms. So they can go very close to, um, you know, to a shelving coastline uh, because they don't draw too much water. So they go in as close as possible to the shore and then they drop their bow. The bow is like a door and the bow drops. And uh, personnel and tanks go straight, go charging straight out of that that bow. That bow forms a ramp, and they go charging straight out of that bow. Now, obviously, uh, the effectiveness of that depends a lot on the uh, on how the how the land shelves from the yeah. waterline uh, yeah. downwards to the uh, to it the. It should be a shallow, smooth. Uh, it, it, it should be. And at the time of the D-Day operations in 1944 in Europe and the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 invasion of the the, the, the uh, Anzio operations in Italy during World War II. Those beaches were actually surveyed very very carefully to uh, to identify um, uh, the places where the shelving was most conducive for men and vehicles to uh, emerge from uh, from the landing craft and the landing ships. Uh, as it happens, we didn't have that luxury in seventy uh, one. Uh, right. So we uh, so the the the, the landing sh the landing craft went in. Uh, to my understanding, they went into an area where the shelving was a little steeper than ideal. And as the admiral says, the, the first craft to go in actually had a draft of Gurkha soldiers on board, who were all carrying forty kilos of uh, you know backpack and arms and ammunition and equipment. And it was very hard for them, and we lost a few. We did lose a few. It's Im I think it's important to acknowledge in this hugely successful story that there were a couple of occasions when um, you know our, our preparation wasn't enough or you know the sheer josh of the gurkhas which is charged uh, off the landing craft as they were told uh, you know it, it it was fatal for some of them and we did lose a few but we did block off we did block off that corridor and uh, the bag of prisoners of war in uh, uh, in uh, bangladesh was increased by um, by the number of people, yes. by the number of uh, troops who didn't escape through that war. I think the Admiral wants to add something. No, I, you know, if I can add in something here, having having sort of uh, uh, begun my career on a landing craft and sort of ended it as a command of a LPD, you know, so so having studied Amphorps, I think Sri, you're completely right. The Admiral is right in uh, foregrounding amphibious operations as the most complex of all tri-services operations. And you, in saying that, there were lessons we learned in the 71 war from there, and we indeed learned. Uh, you also make the point that the larger strategic objective of blocking that exit route and sending a message that we are here too was also registered, which ultimately led to the to the denouement of uh, uh, more than 90,000 prisoners. But but I think the Indian Navy studied that. You take lessons from that. But if you know. Overall, you have to see, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, this is probably symbolism, but it's nice you brought out Admiral Arun Prakash. You know, what, what I like, uh, and there were joint operations between the Army and Air Force, or at least they synchronized their moves well. I think the three services, even when they were operating differently, synchronized their moves well to achieve overall objective. Uh, but there are these small little things, you know, uh, that force Alpha and... Uh, Captain Salmon operated uh, his covert operations group under the army in Fort Williams and uh, the CNC there. And he called his force Alpha as a salute to uh, um, uh, General, I mean, uh, the CNC, uh, uh, the army commander, the one who led the uh, surrender. Uh, General Arora. General Arora, that, that uh, Force Alpha was after him, you know. Yes. And then I also brought out very delightful anecdote. Uh, you have written about that that dog fight, the uh, the Boira, you know, and yes. which which happened to be the first one where you had the army units, you had the Air Force dog fight, and uh, the prisoners of war captured, and there was, you know, a naval witness to that in the form of Chiman Singh, petty officer who had gone in and he was on the way back 
and he was captured by the army at the time yeah. that Burra is happening on top. And he is a Mahavir Chakra winner later. So, so in these very strange ways, uh, the three forces also came together. And and uh, like you said, uh, they were very practical about it. They went they went about their jobs well. And uh, they even if that phrase synchronized operations was not there at that time, they pretty much synchronized their operations. <laughs> I think they did. I, I think the armed forces in uh, in this in the 1971 war, the armed forces actually practiced and demonstrated a lot of concepts which are now sort of uh, known by formal labels. Yes. At that time, I don't think they were. They were just uh, they were just a bunch of uh, you know as you, uh, you know twin, youngsters in their twenties, led by off mid level officers in their thirties, who just went ahead and did what they saw needed to be done. And they were given that kind of confidence and that kind of um, uh, you know, freedom to do that by the senior commanders who put in the staff work and the strategic thinking to put them in circumstances where they were best equipped to do what they did. Fascinating. You know, now, uh, Admiral Rasser, if I could take you, we have, we have discussed technology of jointness and I'm sure we can again discuss this a great deal. But the third of our X factors is leadership, uh, and you've been you've been a leader yourself. You've risen to the highest levels. You saw war. We're talking of leadership uh, during the war and before the war. So, uh, I mean, your own take on I mean, war is all about leadership at the end of the day. Your own take about leadership during the war, uh, including technical leadership, and who who were the people who influenced you? I mean, who inspired you? No, I would say that uh, the Navy as a whole has uh, a great gives, gives a great importance to training, and it is training which uh, prepares you for war. And uh, leadership is part of training because whatever you do uh, as a junior officer, you know that you can uh, only order man to do what you can do yourself. If you have done it yourself then that kind of uh, training is very much in the Navy. And uh, the Navy initially has a lot more emphasis on practical training, which unfortunately our Indian education system does not give as much importance to, to practical training, which the Navy does. And therefore, whatever job you are giving somebody else, if you've done it yourself, it, is, it makes a, such a big difference to the man you are ordering. So therefore, that's the first thing, training and uh, even uh, if you uh, were to discount the, the cadet training, I've done six years of training myself, including, uh, you know, hauling hawsers, you know, uh, even in the, for, uh, the uh, kind of experience we worked in the galleys. We have worked in an exchange and, and uh, we were all engineers were also given diving training and that came in useful. You can see how in Madras there was a scare that some saboteurs had attached limpet mines to Vikram. I don't know whether this story is known. Uh, so there was a huge scare and a lot of diving was done under uh, the uh, Vikrant's hull to, to search for mines. And Commander B. R. Chaudhary, who was the commander E of Vikrant, he had had this training. You can see how 30 years later, he wore a, a diving suit as a commander and went down and checked the propellers and so on. Right. Which, uh, which uh, it, it, I think it was a part of a citation for the Veer Chakra. Because he... And uh, this also meant that uh, when somebody <coughs> was in uh, Kirpan, uh, when they went to pick up the Kukri survivors, the, uh, people jumped into the water because they had done it. It's part of my training. I've jumped off uh, a ship uh, as part of my training. It's, it, and it's considered absolutely routine. So therefore, jumping into the sea uh, is not... Uh, something which uh, uh, is uh, you know to be hesitated you don't hesitate to jump into the sea if you've already done it yourself so like this 
I feel training uh, is the key to uh, this kind of leadership. Now, everyone knows how uh, Edmund Nanda was a, a, such a great leader. But another factor is that leaders should pick leaders. Uh, how That's also very important. Where, for example, Edmund M.K. Roy was made DNI, he was the very... Uh, the, one of the few persons in the job who could, uh, you know, do this kind of Operation X. And who, how many people could have sustained that operation over a year? And with such meager resources and such uh, meager resources, not only in money, but also with kind of people. And how many people did he have? So that kind of leadership was there. And also the personal touch. To give an example, uh, when uh, Vikram's boilers were, uh, you know, causing a lot of concern, Edmund Nanda visited uh, Vikram after she was on the East Coast. Now, in addition to that, he took the trouble, you know, the boiler rooms are 11 decks below the bridge. <laughs> so, he went down the 11 decks, the boiler, the boiler operator stands uh, just about the double bottom of the ship. He's well below the water line. So, Edmund Landa went down uh, and there's a petty officer on watch in the boiler. He asked, uh, he did, what did he ask? He says, Chitti arahi hai? So, uh, petty officer said, Haji. Oh, then he said, kya likhti hai? <laughs> Meaning, what does your wife write about? Uh, he said, Daka jaoge to malmal leke ana. So that shows the kind of spirit. You know, that's you know, this typical Edmund Nanda to ask, you know, he didn't ask about the boiler kaisa hai, kya thik hai, kaise chalaoge, kya ho gaya, crack kidder hai. No, that's not what he asked. And you can see the spirit of the petty officer. And this was, you know, heard by many people. That's how I know the story. <laughs> So that's the kind of uh, leadership we need, personal, uh, yeah. right from the, the CNS going down to the boiler uh, boiler plates, which is very hot, <laughs> very uncomfortable. There's no air conditioning in boiler rooms now, uh, at least then. So that's the kind of uh, leadership, I feel, which, uh, you know, uh, also bench strength. So that's another thing which comes out. <laughs> When uh, look at the leadership of the flag officer commanding Western Fleet at the time, he said, All my commanding officers should ride horses. So, <laughs> during the you see, uh, Navy people don't realize that 99% of your time is waiting, just waiting for them. If you're on watch, you're waiting, you're waiting. By the way, if you're a lookout, we are just looking and for waiting. So, during the waiting period. <laughs> In, uh, in in November, Admiral uh, Kurvela was the leader. Of the, he asked all his commanding officers to come riding with him. And one of his uh, senior most commanding officers was then yeah, yeah. Captain yeah. And he fell down <laughs> and <laughs> broke a bone. Ooh. But what happened? There was uh, Captain Curly Nair who had just come back from Indonesia. Look at the Ben Streng. He came and on board. And in that same ship, Trishul, which I, because I was familiar with it, the Commander E, uh, one Commander Jagota, his father died, uh, unfortunately, at that time. So he was sent on leave for the obsequies. And the next senior most was a lieutenant. I take credit for him because when I was uh, in uh, Trishul in 1970, he was one of the people I had trained. He became the officiating engineer officer for the entire operation. So, though uh, uh, he was only a lieutenant, he was uh, the engineer who took the ship to, uh, you know, through the uh, very uh, severe. Uh, conditions which were on that first uh, trip to because they had to go to uh, Karachi uh, and Trishul and Talwar both were there 
but Trishul was in much better condition. And uh, this lieutenant did brilliantly, and he was mentioned in dispatches. Uh, his name was Dhareshwar, SR Dhareshwar. Uh, similarly, in the case of uh, Talwar, the huge amount of leadership was required because the sh ship's condition was not good. Uh, Captain uh, Sablok Kumar, he was a great leader, and uh, SS Kumar, and he was a gunnery officer. Uh, <coughs> Even the executive officers were, were brilliant in Trishul. There was uh, N.N. Anand, one of the most uh, competent and most meticulous officers uh, one has had in the Navy. It, uh, was N -N, it was the XO of Trishul who see, saw, uh, saw her through. Uh, the engineer officer of uh, Talwar had a very tough job because uh, <coughs> She was one of the ships whose refit had been postponed, <coughs> and she had to go through the war uh, with uh, you no know, beyond her operational normal uh, tenure. And uh, that was uh, uh, then Commander M. B. Ghosh. So uh, these all these people rose to the occasion, uh, and uh, this is, I would say. Uh, for the course. I mean, uh, they didn't think that they were doing anything great because it was a routine for them, whatever they did. So this is what I feel is the way the Navy runs, is that uh, there's very little difference between preparation for war and preparation for the exercises where somebody is breathing down your neck. Fascinating. Fascinating. If I can pop uh, a couple of thoughts Please. in, in the, just backing what the Admiral said. I think I've always... Uh, felt in, in some ways, you know, the armed forces have to be a, a hierarchical kind of organization because it's essential that there, there is a chain of command, right? You do have to order people to do difficult things. But I've always felt that the Navy, to a greater degree than either the Air Force or the Army, is, uh, uh, ha has more of a, uh, of a, of a sense of uh, shipboard solidarity. I mean, w when you go out, when you go out to sea, the entire crew uh, goes together and to some extent, they're all exposed to um, the same risks in a way that is not necessarily true, always true in the other two services. And I think that has... They say you sink or swim together. That's term. You sink or swim together. And I think that promotes a certain um, uh, solidarity among in, in the Navy. And also, if you think back a little, it's only in the last 50 years that we've had, uh, less than 50 years, that we've had the kind of communications capabilities that we have. So going back to a point you made earlier, Admiral, uh, once you're out of the 12 mile, once you're beyond the 12 mile limit, yeah. the ship's captain is the king, right? Yeah. He has, he doesn't have the time to go and check with naval headquarters. Can I open fire or not? I mean, it's only in the last uh, few yeah. years that we've had that kind of comms capability. So there is a, a degree of independence as well as a, a crew solidarity in the Navy, which I think is yeah. one of the most admirable, which I think are among the most admirable characteristics of the Navy. Yeah, yeah, actually, I would say country. that, you know, the moment you leave harbor, you have complete radio silence. You cannot transmit. You can just about listen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, uh, talking about technology, uh, I, you know, all this time, there was one factor which one should mention about Kukri is that uh, that was 1971. But in 1974, we had a, a, you know, we had some brilliant products of our own training, which I keep emphasizing. Uh, two officers who are from ex NDA, ex Iron Shivaji and Panvalsura, who were sent to uh, the Delhi Indian Institute of Technology under a well-known professor in the ration. Yeah. And my, he my found two people. One was Paul Raj and one was A.S. Krishna. Yes. Uh, Paul Raj went on to do the uh, uh, his PhD. And he yeah. produced a sonar, but it was 1974. <laughs> and so therefore, he, uh, I wish he had been born three, three. I always say, why didn't you do it earlier? He wasn't born earlier. <laughs> That's all uh, that we can say. That if we had the uh, his... Absolute sonar in 1971, things would be different for Kukri. Because uh, AS, uh, AS technology, uh, Indian uh, Ocean, uh, the, it gives the most challenging uh, problems with uh, temperature inversion, etc. And especially the shallow waters, deep waters, very, very difficult. And all those were solved by uh, 
Paul Raj, who is now a Marconi uh, uh, Fellow. Award, award, award. But people don't realize that even in the passive mode, a ship can be heard 50 miles away by just listening carefully. But you must have the technology to separate out the noise uh, which you don't want with the noise you want, which is that swish of that propeller. So that is the kind of technology that uh, is uh, you, you hear a ship 50 miles away by just listening with a with super technology. And that's the kind of uh, technology that is there, uh, which was there in '74, <laughs> which we didn't have in '71, and that had uh, tragic consequences. I'd made a mention you know, of that presentation in my book, uh, uh, which contributed to the the loss of the book. I, I think uh, it is sort of becoming. You know, Amish, what, what I particularly like about what Admiral Rao has said uh, and, and what Sri has added is one is how leadership in the Navy is kind of different within the overall uh, scenario. And I'm very glad that he's brought out names, you know, because we consider ourselves silent service. See, unlike the, with the highest regard, unlike Sam Manetcho or P.C. Lal or Sagat or Aurora or Jacob, naval names are not much heard. Admiral Landa, of course, is huge, but even he is, you know, sort of uh, when you discuss others, there's not so much discussion. And his role, I think, has been brought out beautifully by Admiral Rao. Uh, but also these traits of picking up the right team, saying the right things, you know, having enough bench strength. These are, I think, important aspects of leadership. But I'm also very glad that he's mentioned, until now they were not mentioned, lots of technical leaders, you know, uh, 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 they are saying, uh, Bhalla, JTG Pereira, Bilu Chaudhary, uh, the engineer officers on small ships, Dhareshwar, because in previous episodes we've discussed other tactical level leadership by the executive officers. I think I'm very happy that he's mentioned how there were lots of technology oriented leaders. And I'm very happy that the names, you know, in, 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 in our honors board, they figure today. I'm so glad it's been mentioned. Over to you. Yeah, no, in fact, actually, I think uh, we've covered most of the stuff that I could think of in terms of questions. So I was wondering, uh, Shikant, if you had any more questions or should we bring in uh, guests to us? Audience, I'll just ask one last question uh, to uh, Admiral Rao, uh, and, and uh, Shri can also come in here. Uh, I think because Admiral Rao did mention earlier when we're talking about the morale uh, uh, of our uh, sailors at that time, uh, and he has made allusions to that. And uh, Sri, you to your personal uh, views about how the Navy ran its campaign. But I'd request both of you to be very quick with your response on this, uh, the robustness of our structure and morale for Admiral Rao, and your views on the naval campaign for Sri. And then we open it up for audience discussions. No, I would say that uh, to me, uh, the uh, way the Navy runs, there's very little difference between peace and war. That's how it should be. We are always ready. And uh, the <coughs> there's a question of some danger when you go in harm's way, which will, of course, affect people. But uh, sink or swim together. And that's the motto which I feel uh, runs the Navy. Uh, Shri? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, it's it's very easy to say that the, the naval campaign, uh, the Indian Navy's campaign in the 1971 war was, the word is appropriate, it is brilliant. The, uh, the, the quick, uh, you know, one, two strikes on Karachi, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sinking of the Ghazi, uh, the um, uh, the aircraft carrier operations um, uh, you know, off uh, uh, Chittagong and Cox's Bazar, we benefited from a couple of strokes of luck, certainly. I think the, the sinking of the Ghazi, we certainly benefited from some luck. We had bad luck in the loss of the Kukri, but that's, these are uh, a part of the game. And I think overall, I think the, 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 uh, the loss shows that it wasn't a, a walkover and it should never, uh, however much we uh, you know, we mark the victory and the success. We should never assume that it was a walkover. The fact that the raids on Karachi were completely lossless for us, despite all the things that went wrong, including the uh, 
the engine uh, malfunction mm -hmm. that the admiral referred to it, it was a, it, it, it was such a powerful there were two such powerful punches thrown completely lossless on our side uh, and yeah. uh, and you know, the the the, uh, the aircraft carrier operations on the uh, on, on the east, in the, in the east i think they would be make a wonderful case study sometimes i wonder if the british would pick those up as a case study because after all the vikram was built at uh, you know harland and wolf in belfast uh, the aircraft that operated were seahawks and well the allies are french but uh, french. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the seahawks are uh, you know in their time a much beloved british design um, so I, I, overall i think the campaign was brilliant and the morale was sky high uh, the admiral mentioned uh, uh, the captain of the Trishu, uh, um, later Commodore Curly Nye, he was a family yes. friend. And I yeah. know how high the morale was just from having heard him talk. So. You know, campaign was brilliant, morale was sky high. That's a wonderful way to sort of now get in the audience. And you know, Curly Nye is mentioned very well by uh, uh, Commodore Jerax too. Uh, Binash, he said, I had so much freedom from him and so much guidance. So, so this talks of our bench strength of a man who just came in a few days before the war, and he yeah. led the second second raid on Karachi. Yeah. Uh, this and he this sailed alongside Zarat. He sailed alongside uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. and Port, almost right into the mouth. Of yeah, the mouth of the mouth. Of, yeah. So that's that's a wonderful cue to get in our audience. I think it's been it's been wonderful talking with all of you. Now let's see. Uh, what questions and uh, uh, comments are thrown at us? Uh, who do we have? Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Commodore Kesnur as well as uh, as well as uh, Admiral Rao. Uh, now we, we spoke about the technical side <laughs> and also the morale and how high it was. And I am a close follower of maritime issues myself. So most of the time I hear people saying that, okay, the when you're studying war in retrospect, uh, the losing side draws more lessons learned. However, you know, the, the when we study about 71 campaign, we were the side who came on top. But still, uh, there, there must be surely some good takeaways for us or for Indian Navy to, you know, lessons that we took home. Uh, so I want uh, a more, uh, you know, what lessons were drawn from this victory or a good campaign of 71 uh, when we when we look at it. Admiral Rao, sir, lessons of the yes, 71 war. No, you go uh, ahead and I'll follow. No, you must, uh, no, I would say one lesson is that you can't fight a war only with new ships. All your ships have to be ready for war. Very, very, very well. Uh, very, very. Uh, Joe, if if I can get you right, um, uh, you uh, probably meant, because if your question was, uh, losers learn more from the war, then uh, did we learn anything from uh, the setbacks or something? I mean, uh, apart from the triumph, the brilliant success, uh, I will highlight three or four things as a historian. Uh, Admiral Rao has put it very beautifully saying everyone must be ready for war. I would think that one of the lessons we learned was from the loss of Kukri, our, our ASW, both in the development of Sonar, Commodore Paul Raj, giving greater Philip to ASW, including Air ASW, making aviation an important part of ASW. I think that was one big lesson and takeaway. Second, I think we learned lessons in terms of amphibious. It was not totally successful. We realized that. We realized the amount of coordination needed for amphibious operations. So I think we learned a lot from that in terms of how you must uh, progress amphibious operations uh, going into the future. But I think you also learn uh, about, about leadership and about people playing. I think that in, in many ways, the 71 war, uh, though we keep calling it our finest hour uh, was in some ways also our band of brothers movement you know uh, uh, the discussions have brought out various fleet CEOs the great teams I think we could we could have a couple of those pictures here of the missile boat commanding officers what Admiral Rao talked about missile boat western fleet commanding officers led by Admiral Chandy Kuruvila so I think the importance of having that band of brothers concept 
in fleet amongst your captains amongst people i think that was one of the biggest lessons that we learned that that teamwork bonding camaraderie is what gives us uh, victory in war but i take your point uh, uh, the winners must learn as much from a war as much as losers too i think that's a very good point <coughs> uh who's the next one who's the next uh, uh we have we have who's that tatha who's that? oh that's okay it. kirti kirti tejas uh, thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar and uh, if you could fire your question and who are you addressing uh thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity uh, of listening to this webinar and i am a student of center for excellence in maritime studies uh, at the university of mumbai and uh, i've heard all the previous webinars and apart from these five seminars and other books i'm sure there are many possibly untold stories of the 1971 war so my question is to vice admiral rao and to commodore kesnur about uh, any other untold stories which they would like to share with us thank you uh rao rao Ra sir and sri can i mean no i would say um the uh kukri thinking had number of poignant stories uh, which came up uh there was uh, uh one uh, engineering mechanic who was asked to go and get some tea for the the rest of the crew in the engine room so he came up on the deck and he was one of the survivors uh, so such uh, stories will be there which would not be well known and uh, also uh, people from uh, kirpan uh, they showed a lot of uh, heroism in saving the uh, crew of uh, kukri and i said that there was one uh, young lieutenant girwalkar we didn't hesitate to jump into the water and you know help people because he was a good swimmer uh, so such stories would of course be there uh, and uh, one i don't know whether uh, commodore uh, mike bada uh, would have told this story i think that uh, when you are in a sea hawk uh, uh, when you are attacking there are several uh, different buttons for whether you're firing rockets or cannons or uh, releasing bombs and so on and all those are on your fingertips now when he had, when he went to cox's bazaar at the critical moment when he opened fire he pressed his right finger instead of his left left hand finger so he missed and he had to go around again and fire his cannon with his left uh, 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 finger and uh, so saved the day otherwise he would not have been uh, excused uh, this failure there there were stories like that which in the heat of the moment one people uh, would certainly uh, these are uh, uh, there would be many many more stories like this shri you would like to add some i mean i'll, I'll take some but you could you could sure. also add. so sure, always there are always untold stories in uh, uh, in in war time I and mean, the nature of war is such that there are going to be untold stories and i think one of the great contributions that historians from outside the establishment like you know students outside the establishment including yourself can do is to help dig out those stories and in india i think the best source for those stories is the families because in many cases the uh, the participants are Uh, reluctant to talk but the families sometimes have picked up enough so that you can get the beginnings of a story and then you can go to original sources that's a that's a broad point uh, to make and i think the, i think the, the rest of us uh, have uh, have as much of a role as the navy in 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 capturing and preserving these stories in fact in other countries uh, it is not the navy itself which is the primary repository of some of these stories so i would i would sort of leave that thought with you but among the untold uh, stories that i'm aware of I, i was actually aware of the story that uh, uh, admiral rao just uh, uh, told us i i heard it from the formation leader so who said so so i i i did hear that story but and i've mentioned it i've, I've got a one line mention i think in my book although i don't identify the pilot 
it was em- it was embarrassing for him. But, he, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, I think um, untold stories. I think uh, the, the 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 seeking operations from uh, Mumbai and um, uh, later from uh, um, I can't remember where they deployed yeah. north to poor uh, one, poor one, poor one. Was it yeah. right, right, sir? So uh, I think the seeking operations they were ultimately unsuccessful. They didn't catch the submarine which sank the uh, the Ghazi. But there was a lot of dedication that went into that operation, and uh, you know, two crews flew. They they flew themselves out to try and find yes. uh, the submarine, the, the Pakistani submarine that had sunk the Kufri. So I think that yeah, is because a, uh, the, it's very tough because they have a dunking sonar. Correct. They have to lower it and hover at that precise spot without any movement for hours and uh, listen because you got the helicopter itself is a noisy place but you have to listen to that swish uh, very carefully and so the uh, i think admiral bharatan uh, would be able to tell you more about that uh, yeah, because yeah, he was yeah. the observer in the seeking oh, sitting there and uh, listening waiting 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 that's uh, a really hard story you know my, uh, sorry go ahead no, no my understanding is that the crews tried to do that they 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 kept uh, searching um, until they ran out of fuel and then a, a tanker came from um, you know to from uh, somewhere else it it, uh, it wasn't available on the site they had to wait for the tanker to refuel and they they used up all the fuel in that tanker uh, but th- there were other reasons why they were unsuccessful and um, I, I don't think uh, we can go into that. No, the but, North Arabian Sea is particularly difficult for uh, anti-submarine uh, operations yeah. because of the uh, okay, temperature inversions, the tropics, yes. and the shallow. Uh, you get uh, you, you know you get bouncing uh, you know signals from the ships from the sea from the rocks, all kinds of very very difficult. This this places. this would be. Too technical, you know. So, but but I I, I think uh, the bigger point, you know, you're making is I like that that one repositories of these stories are usually with families, and there are many waiting to be told. And I'm sure the same thing about seventy one or two uh, 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 Commodore Bada himself. One, there was suspense when he was waiting because he took that extra chakkar uh, back back on the aircraft carrier. There was a bit of tension about the delay, and also. Commodore Bada was throughout flying with a dislocated shoulder. So that's that's a wonderful story that he brought out when uh, he did a webcast with us. But, but Kirti, there are many such, at least from the Navy side, you know, one can write of so many stories. Uh, the role of the survey ships, for example, uh, they were involved in towing, they were involved in uh, capturing or commandeering some of the ships that were likely to have had contraband. Uh, I, some of the ships that were not part of the war, like Vidyut, which was sort of waiting back, uh, but but you know, uh, so so she didn't do the attack on Karachi, but there was huge importance in being the rear guard in case some uh, you know attack came from the Pakistan side. And ultimately, I understand Vidyut was armed and ready till March because you know we, we had to wait in case anything happens after the war ends. So there are, I think, huge amount of stories, human interest stories, and and perhaps uh, lots more waiting to be uh, read and heard and discussed in future. So who's our uh, next person? Katha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hello. Katha, if, uh, welcome uh, to this webinar. If you can fire your question and who are you addressing? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for this opportunity and it was a very absorbing session. So my question is to uh, Mr. Shri Kumar. I wanted to ask you that what do you think were the turning points in this war on land, air and at sea as well? And at what point did the outcome become very clear? Thank you. It's it was a very short war, and I think the um, uh, the Indian ascendancy was uh, uh, very clear right from the start. So I I wouldn't describe the the key moments as turning points because it's not that it's not that the the navy was on the de- or, or it's not that the Indian armed forces were on the defensive for a, for the first week and then there was a turning point and it uh, and and they succeeded in the offensive. So I would you know maybe this is just the historian in me being a little nerdy. 
but I wouldn't use the term turning point. But I would say that the, you know, the, the key um, moments which uh, sort of established the, uh, um, the, the, the direction of the war, I think clearly the, the Karachi raids were among them. Um, I think the, um, uh, the sinking of the Ghazi was among them. Uh, the, uh, the successful, the continuing successful operations of um, uh, the Vikrant and her air group, I think that marked a certain ascendancy simply because they were flying so unopposed. And, and that, I think, was uh, uh, you know, clear evidence that the, uh, uh, that the Pakistanis had uh, virtually given up uh, you know, halfway into the, or they were waiting to be rescued by the Americans. They thought the Seventh Fleet was going to come in and rescue them or something on those lines. I mean, that's a slightly exaggerated version of uh, what they were thinking. But they, some of them definitely had that illusion that they were going to be rescued. So, so I think those, uh, from the Navy's point of view, I think those are three very key points which establish the Navy's ascendance in in, in the war. Um, in the uh, uh, on the uh, um, on land, I think the uh, uh, this is a little out of the Navy's um, ambit, but I think the the crossing of multiple rivers by helicopter by helicopter-borne infantry, uh, particularly of four corps led by uh, Lieutenant General Sadat Singh. Sadat Singh. I, yeah, I think that was a, a, a major, major contributor to the victory. And as the sort of leapfrog, as the um, uh, as the the troops were leapfrogged over the rivers by the Air Force helicopters, and, and that again was a, a, a largely unplanned kind of operation, which was executed by you know thirty-year-old commanders, small unit commanders, working with their you know 20, 25 year old uh, troops. So, so I think that was. That story really unnerved, or the, the results of that really unnerved the Pakistanis, and it, it broke their morale and their will to resist, uh, even more than uh, even more than the casualties that they inflicted. It just convinced the Pakistanis that resistance was futile. So, so I think on the army side, I would I would definitely give a lot of importance to those helicopter-borne um, uh, crossings of the rivers, uh, and in the air, I think. Uh, in many ways, I think that the Boira dogfight, although it took place, um, you know, more than a week before the fo the war formally started, in practice there was shooting going on on the ground already. So, um, uh, so fighting was already taking place. The Boira dogfight, which again was a lossless outcome for um, for India and virtually wiped out the Pakistani formation. I think that was a sort of a, 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 a it sort of. Uh, was an indicator of the way the war was going to go in, in many ways. I think the, the, the complete success and the lossless outcome for India was, it, it couldn't have been a better tonic at the start of the war. So, so I, would, I would single these out as some of the best, uh, uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the moments of the war which told you which way the war was going, if, if that answers your question. You know, uh, just 30 seconds here, not so much to answer this question, but I'm glad that you brought it out, uh, Sri. Uh, this is an answer to Joshi. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the arrival of the Enterprise Group uh, into, into uh, uh, the Indian Ocean or the Bay of Bengal, so to say, while the Indian Navy and uh, our leadership handled it very well at the tactical and the strategic level, I think that's also one of the lessons that we took after the war that how does in India, India in future uh, buy insurance against such sort of, you know, uh, uh, power projection by other countries? And what are the capabilities we should build to deter that sort of, uh, you know, uh, push by others? I think that's one of the big lessons that also yes, we took. Take away. Important take away. Yeah. I, uh, Neha Matre, uh, if you can introduce yourself and uh, fire your question and who are you addressing? No. Uh, let's see if she's on the phone. Hi. Yes, yeah. I'm on the phone. Hi. And I follow Maritime history very closely. So thank you very much for this wonderful session. My question is to any or all of the panelists and moderators. So considering that 1971 war was our finest hour in many, many ways, do you think that the, the commemoration of this war in literature, popular culture, movies, 
museums is underwhelming and very little. So what more should be done uh, by all of us, whether it is citizens or uh, people in services? May I uh, jump in on this as yeah. you know, even though I'm not a district person because as a, someone in the popular culture, it is shocking how, uh, uh, how little uh, this war is discussed and frankly in some ways it shows uh, the problems in our culture over the last 70 years that we don't celebrate our, uh, uh, our own heroes, our own successes and this is extremely, extremely, extremely unfortunate. Uh, you know, we are, uh, all of us are making amends in our own uh, small ways. She has written wonderful books. Uh, Shrikanth is uh, working on the Naval History Project. At the Nehru Center, we try to put up these naval webinars. But there's much more that we need to do. I'd love to take up, you know, a documentary uh, uh, series on this. I, you know, uh, hope to take it up sometime. There more needs to be done. Uh, there are a few movies uh, that have been made, but not enough. Uh, if if any other country had fought <coughs> just humanitarian war like this, uh, uh, the 1971 war, uh, we would be, they would be talking about it everywhere. Uh, and it is unfortunate that, uh, that this has not been done in India. And it, frankly, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it says something rather poor about uh, those who control uh, India's media, India's narrative, uh, India's culture. It says something rather poor. That's my honest and very brutal view, but that's my no, uh, We must give credit to the Nehru Center for uh, this. Uh, Thank you, sir. We are trying. We are trying to do something in our own small way, but a lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done. Sri, uh, actually, uh, you know about an untold story. Uh, I recall uh, one incident which I feel is uh, crucial. You know when Ghadiyal and Guldar uh, went uh, alongside. In uh, into Hong Harbor, they found two uh, landing craft which were tied up alongside, with close to them. When uh, they investigated, they found that these were landing craft which had been gifted to East Pakistan by the World Bank. They were brand new. So immediately, you look at the way things happened. The uh, commanding officer of Ghadiyan Guldar, they sent boarding parties onto this uh, landing craft. They went on board. They all uh, went to their specific positions. Uh, the uh, ERA, two ERAs were sent. They started the engine. You see, uh, uh, this craft had Rolls Royce. Nobody in India heard Rolls makes the engine at that time. So we uh, went, started those engines, and the crew uh, brought the ships to Parasi. And this is how the uh, train has. And this is the character of the crew that Ghadiyar and Guldar were two ordinary uh, LSTs. The people they would spare were the ones who would, uh, you know, who would who were not vital for their own ships. They went on board. Ten minutes they started in half an hour. They left and brought and came walk Kuti. They were returned to East Pakistan or Bangladesh. But look at the way this is training, this is uh, initiative, this is leadership, True. this is uh, you know skill, everything in this one story. So, Sri, you'd like to uh, go back to Neha's question, and, and or you want me to? You you are since you've written a book on that, you say it, and I'll just add a bit. Sure. So I'll uh, simply say, um, uh, you know, that I uh, I agree completely with uh, what um, uh, Amish said. Uh, I think the war has been inadequately um, has been very very inadequately recorded and disseminated and uh, uh, marked uh, by India. And I think, um, uh, you know, in, in fact, uh, you know, I, I have a colleague. Uh, uh, well, I have a, I have a sort of uh, um, a British histor a British military historian who's actually described it as a national disgrace. But, uh, but I would add that there are two, there are two historically contributing factors why we couldn't uh, make the most. Well, three maybe that why we couldn't make the most of it at the time. So I'll just run through them as quickly as possible. 
The first is, I think, um, uh, at the end of the war, there actually was, in the first few days at the end of the, uh, uh, after the surrender in Dhaka, there actually was some thought given to holding back about 150 to 200 of the Pakistani officers who had been specifically identified by Bangladeshis, by Mukti Bahini and Bangladeshis as uh, responsible for perpetrating war crimes and atrocities. So there was a serious, there was serious consideration given to holding back those 150 odd Pakistanis and subjecting them to a war crimes trial. Right? Now the reason we didn't do it, I I think, and this is this is sort of uh, the, the the cabinet papers are uh, some of the cabinet papers are now accessible publicly, but uh, uh, but not uh, not fully. I think uh, two two major contributors why we didn't do that is one is that the United States, prompted by Pakistan, basically made it clear that they would veto any such attempts and they made the complete release of all prisoners of war back to Pakistan a condition for their recognition of Bangladesh and not vetoing Bangladesh's entry into the United Nations. Okay? Now this again is a, this is a different story, it's not as well known as, uh, as it should be. I think even uh, Mr. Chanchekar Daskupta's recent book on the diplomatic history of the war doesn't really cover it. But basically, the Americans made it clear, and clearly at the behest of Pakistan, that they would veto Bangladesh's admission to the United Nations if we didn't, uh, if uh, they had they had a lot of conditions and we were able to negotiate them down. But one of them was the return of all prisoners. So we never subjected the identified Pakistanis to, uh, uh, to a form of war crime uh, uh, tribunal. And remember, there was no international criminal court at that time. So we would have had to set up the tribunal ourselves. There would have been bitter opposition from both Pakistan and the United States. We didn't really have the diplomatic strength to fight the United States on this issue. So I think that's one factor. We didn't set up a, a war crimes tribunal for understandable reasons. We wanted to close everything off. We wanted Bangladesh to be admitted to the UN and become a member nation. Too. That was the purpose of the war. That was the purpose of the war. So I think that is an understandable decision <coughs> by the Indian government of the time. The second contributory factor is that uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was assassinated three years after the war. And I think that and the, the, uh, Sheikh's assassination led to a series of military coups and military governments in Bangladesh. Which, thankfully, they've gone beyond that now. But it was a very painful period for Bangladesh. But that 10 or 15 year period was not a good advertisement for India's success in having intervened in Bangladesh. Today, I think the fact that Bangladesh is doing so well economically and in its human development indicators, I think that is something that India should be proud of. India should be absolutely proud of the fact that a country whose birth we kind of midwife is doing so well. I think that is something in which India should take great pride and we should work with Bangladesh to remove irritants and make sure that Bangladesh and we bring a common uh, perspective to the, uh, the liberation war. You know, uh, Amish, if I can just, you know, uh, Neha's question, I I, I, I uh, believe also dealt with at a level of uh, how we should sort of celebrate it in the mass media and books and culture, popular culture. So just 30 seconds. One, one of course, I believe that uh, the fact that there was no television then, you know, what television gave certain immediacy to Cargill and to things that have happened after that. And social media has made that even more prominent now which was not there in 71, so probably, and, and there is not enough footage that we, we probably ought to have or should have had because people who are fighting are not thinking of photographing and crews were not there uh, taking all that. But I think the larger point she makes, and all of you agree, is that we need more books, uh, more uh, shows, more museums, uh, uh, more articles, everything from comic features to serious historical books, uh, to uh, movies, to documentaries. I think 71, we've touched just the tip of iceberg. And, and uh, uh, the word she uses, it's underwhelming. I think I'll go with that. And particularly, I'm very happy that uh, we have been partnering with you to tell the Navy stories. Uh, as we say, it's a silent service. And I'm so happy that our stories of the 1971 war have come alive through you uh, and through all our esteemed panelists. Uh, so that's our little contribution to making known what the Navy did during the war. Shrikant, I, I speak uh, 
for the Nehru Center and for the High Commission of India in the UK, where I say that it has been a singular honor for us, uh, this uh, series of, of programs, uh, of webinars, uh, five uh, webinars that we have hosted at the Nehru Center. Uh, we have received the blessings of uh, the CNS, of uh, the High Commissioners to make this happen. And uh, all our esteemed guests and uh, uh, Vice Admiral Sir Shikant on this particular webinar, the entire support of uh, the Navy. Shikant, you most of all, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And I hope uh, all our viewers out here in India and, the, and in the UK and indeed around the world, I hope you uh, enjoyed this entire series of webinars. They're all up on our uh, YouTube and Facebook. Please do watch them. Watch them all. In, uh, now you can binge watch all of them together. Uh, share it with your friends. Share the stories of our brave warriors. Uh, who fought and won uh, a just war uh, and who liberated uh, East Pakistan into the very successful nation of Bangladesh uh, today. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Thank you so much.